Thank you. Well, okay. I was told those microphones were really quiet, so I scared myself there. But uh, please let me know if I hold the microphone down too low and, and you can't hear from the back. Uh, you know, it's obviously a, a very busy area that we do these Warrior Corners in, and, and I think the topics that we discuss are absolutely essential to what's happening in our Army today and what we're doing um, within the G4 to help unburden the soldier, and then obviously how industry can help us. So as we proceed today, I think that's the, the, the approach that we want to take. This is my Sergeant Major, your Sergeant Major of the G4, Sergeant Major Petra Casares, and uh, you know we go back to a, another assignment. Woo! Woo! Uh, but, uh, but she is doing just incredible things, and give me that vision of the soldier, the same thing that the Chief has translated upon us as a requirement, okay? So if we can uh, flip forward one slide, please. As we talk about the Chief's four focus areas, the biggest area that our logisti logisticians and sustainers are engaged in is focused in on deliver ready combat formations. Right? There's a reason that the chief gave that task as a focus area to Army Materiel Command. And so we find ourselves in this space each and every day. As the chief went out and did his uh, preparations, the, the, the team that went, his transformation team went out, they made a lot of observations in the motor parks, uh, motor pools, on the installations, supply rooms, uh, the arms rooms, and what he saw was a heavily burdened force, right? We may have issued equipment to the organization or to the unit that we did not divest of the old equipment first, right? So new equipment fielding, no divestiture. 20 years of combat, you name it, right? There's these things that have happened that the force has become burdened on. So Army Material Command is working on a thing called R2E, the rapid reduction of excess. Great, right? That's gonna take the equipment away from the formation that is not on their current MTOs uh, and, and, and enable them in a way that is, is, is best postured. We are also in a situation where the personnel in our formations are not at 100%. And if anyone in this room can raise their hand and say that their formation's at 100%, I'm gonna go ahead and take some of those soldiers away from you to kind of cross level them. I'll, be, I'll meet my G1 partner. Right? But as the personnel are not at 100%, we have individuals who are manning systems that is not the system that they were trained on. Right? And so as an individual is conducting their PMCS, they're not necessarily trained in that way, which has a direct effect on our mechanic, which has a direct effect on our 92 series. And so you can see how this can spiral out of control. Right? So the chief said, all right, we're taking care of the excess problem with AMC. What else can we do for our soldiers? And he said, I think that we are over-servicing our equipment. Wow. Is there anyone here who believes that we over-service our equipment in the Army? My hand is up. I see a lot of logisticians with their hands up, right? In our policy and how we wrote it, and we trace it all the way back so far to 1938, I think is the date. 1938, we set our standards for how we service equipment. That is an interesting uh, flow of information, right? 90 years ago, almost 90 years. And so what we said is, what can we do within policy? What can we look at? What data do we have to ensure that we can go ahead and look at our services and make changes that potentially are ready for today? So um, there's a wonderful CW5 who was a regimental uh, warrant officer when I was the chief of ordnance, uh, Chief May. He had the year of the chief of staff of the Army. And he said, sir, here's what I think we can do. I think we can make changes to our time-based services. And so what an incredible task to look at, right? That gave us our problem statement. Can we make a change? Are we assuming risk if we make changes to our time-based services? So the chief turned to uh, the G4. He said, you own the policy. Go ahead and figure this out. And uh, enabled us to do it immediately. So in June of last year, we assembled 
a bunch of CW5s from all of the lifecycle management commands, right? Army Materiel Command was there, our ASALT partners were there, the Ordnance School was there, CASCOM was there, and we sat down and I locked them in a room in the Pentagon and said, you all cannot leave until we have answered five questions, okay? Those five questions were, what is the feasibility of codifying the current NCOMP, so the non-combat operations plan service intervals, and the low usage service interval programs. What do we need to do to first of all codify those, right? So they were available, we've been using them, we've been executing them through exports, but how can we codify the best practices of NCOMP and low usage? The second thing was, what additional fleets that were not previously captured in income and low usage can we add to the program? What additional you know, scale and scope can we add to it to ensure that we are better enabled as an Army? Then we said, let's outline the data methodology and resources that are required to create additional studies. What can we do to do additional studies to look at this problem? The next thing was recommend policy improvements to the NCOMP and low usage program. So what, what policy changes can we make? Because it's quite frankly uh, very burdensome. And then lastly uh, is to identify other options to achieve efficiency. And I locked them in a the room with those five questions. They came out with some amazing stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Major Castres because instead of giving us a bureaucratic answer, which these five questions guided them to, right? Look at the policy, tell me this, do this, do this. Um, how can we increase fleets? What studies do we need to do? Right, that was going to be over the horizon in time if you're starting to use studies to make decisions. And so those CW5s emerged from the room, um, and it was actually on the same day, and they said, here is what we need to do, and then uh, actually captured it. Um, Rick, Mr. Rick Marsh and uh, Dr. Bill Brew down in the Army G4s, 4-4M division, uh, went ahead and codified this in an X-Sword, and we are moving out very quickly. So I'll give you uh, Sergeant Major Castres who can walk you through what the warrant officers did in the room, and then the results that emerged. Sergeant Major. Okay, so as a maintainer, what I can tell you that, you know, I'm burdening the maintainer really enables readiness. So as a maintainer, we have always done the semi-annual and the annual services just because that's what we have always done. So instead of really focusing on those conditions and needs-based services, we have focused on just doing services when we think that the time told us so. So what we have done now is we started with the exhort started with four fleets. We started with the Humvee, the FMTV, the uh, Hemet, and the PLS, and we took away all the semi-annual and the annual services. We still kept the biannual or the every two year services, and we ensured that we enable our maintainers to focus on those readiness things like troubleshooting, unscheduled maintenance, and anything else that creates readiness versus doing services that are just uh, things that are done, you know, replacing the filters and everything. And it also enables us to serve, ser uh, uh, it reduces the resources like the um, filters, the POL products and, and whatnot, and it allows us to have our maintainers in the right place in our motor pools by taking taking away those time-based services. All right, so what you can see across the bottom, and maybe it's a little hard to see just because of the, the digits on the, uh, the, the um, screen here, is the journey that we took for these four fleets, okay? Taking the data that existed already from NCOMP and the low usage program showed us that there was limited, actually let's just say no risk, um, you know obviously there's risk in anything you do, but the, it, the data did not highlight any risk in extending these services, right? Removing that annual and semi-annual services for these four fleets. So we said, let's let's capture it, right? Let's let's move out right now and capture it in the XOR. On the bottom, what you see is this journey, and it ends in G Army, and then the actual rewrite of the policy, right? It's not just stopping at the XOR and saying we're done. 
because what then happens in the units, if you don't take it all the way into G Army, is now they're having to do the manipulation of the services in the program, right? And so that is why we are taking this not from an exception to policy perspective, not from you know a, a, an NCOMP or low usage. This is actually um, impacting units today. Uh, if you calculated the, the man hours, and, and you may remember going back to uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army's re remarks before, um, it was in the, the hundreds of thousands of man hours that were captured purely for one core. And again, as Sergeant Major talked about the Class 3, the Class 9, the HAZMAT, you can think about how all of those uh, um, have an impact beyond the time of the actual service itself. Um, additionally, you talked about, Sergeant Major, the, uh, the M4s and the M16s. Hopefully there's not too many units that still have M16s in their formations, but there still are a couple. Um, and so the M4s and the M16s, right, the time-based services, not the rounds, not the hours, not the, uh, the, the miles, right, it's the time-based services only. Um, we, we had some uh, students at PCC yesterday who were talking about I'm meeting the mileage before the before the time-based services. We are driving so many miles in our vehicles. I said, great, keep maintaining in that standard, right? And, and so um, working obviously very, very well from that perspective. And just to add that, you know, the one basic that is never going to weigh, it, going away is the operator PMCS. I forgot to mention that in the beginning. So we always ensure that the 10 level maintenance stays so before any vehicle can be operated or dispatched, it still has to be properly PMCS and there will still be command maintenance and motor stables. This just allows our maintainers truly to focus on where they need to. And then to uh, you know, go back into those weapon systems, uh, those services were moved from quarterly to semi-annual. They will still be done by the 91 Foxes or armament um, technicians and uh, ensuring that the, the weapons are still gauged yearly but we don't actually have to do the quarterly services as we did before. Okay, so then the question remains, great, four fleets, all variants of those. What about the rest of the Army? Right, you don't have that data necessarily, you don't have um, the input, and so we can go ahead and we can continue this and go on, here's another fleet, here's another fleet, here's another fleet. And we will do that. We will do that till we finish the, the, the fleets in totality. Um, up here in the, behind me you see, right now there's a pilot going on at the Armor School to look at the M1 and the M2 platforms only. Okay? I'm not talking about the weapon systems, I am talking about the platform only. We are using a very limited environment where we have FMX maintenance contracts that we can control the situation, we can visualize and see ourselves to gain that data, and then once that pilot is complete, we will make an assessment from the data, and we may move out on the M1 and M2 platforms um, as, as purely the platforms, not the, not the uh, weapon systems themselves. So a lot more to follow there. Uh, that data um, and that uh, next touch point that we have is, is, is meeting next month. We'll meet with the Armor School uh, General Simmering and, uh, and, and work through and understand what we learned in that process there and what risk is there and, and how to mitigate that risk or what's the best way forward. So it was uh, purely an extension, again, only on the time-based services for those two platforms. And uh, to you know, kind of give you a teaser, it's, it's looking pretty good right now. What can industry do? Right, that is the next question. What can industry do? I believe that we need to incorporate and reinforce and continue to hold accountable standards to our future contracts in writing the requirement for one, maintainability, but two, the providing of the testing and evaluation data for future pieces of equipment to give us a service schedule specific to the platform. Rather than the Army adopting the 1938 standards and saying this is a weapon, this is a wheeled vehicle, this is an armored vehicle, or so on. Right? If we go ahead and we adopt that historical standard, we are going to be in the same situation where we have to go through this process that we've been doing uh, in order to incorporate a specific standard. I don't believe that that's what industry does right now in, uh, in, in cars, right? I believe that you, know, you have 
um, if you bought uh, a Chevy Volt versus if you bought a, a Tesla, the standards are completely different, right? It's not a, this is the standard of how you should maintain an electric vehicle. And so the expectation, I think, towards the future will result, you know, obviously ASAL community and the sustainment community coming together, but we're going to continue to do this, but we're going to make change towards the future. And so that is the vision I see uh, uh, moving forward for, for the sustainment community. And I just wanted to add that this is going to be a continuous assessment uh, together with the industry. So as we move along, you know, whatever lessons learned, we're going to ensure that those get put in uh, TMs. Uh, we ensure that the GCSS Army is properly tied into it. And then we'll ensure that our Compo 2 and 3 teammates uh, are actually in the same, you know, that, that the whole total Army is working together this and, and uh, in case there are any differences for Compo 2 and 3, that we'll take those also into consideration. All right, what are your questions? Yeah, so, um, so ma'am, I hear what you're saying, and, and, and I agree. I think you should actually ask industry for a little bit more. Um, I think um, industry, as we innovate and bring in, and, and with the technology as we go forward, I think you should probably get us to uh, institute the sensors inside in order to um, go all the way to the uh, to CBM Plus standards. Um, you know, I, the story I like to tell is, you know, you mentioned the, the, the vehicles or whatever, and so yeah, there's time-based, and then, you know, then there was, so, you know, it used to be we drove a car until the engine blew up you know, way back, and, and then you started changing the oil every six months. Well, cars nowadays, they have sensors, and they tell us when the fuel filter needs changed, and they tell us when the oil filters need changed, and they tell us when the air filters need changed, and that's a, a basic understanding of CBM Plus, which I know the Army is trying to go to, so I think it's incumbent that as we develop equipment, you ensure that that is a requirement. Sorry, that wasn't really a question. But. No, thank you, Sergeant Major, for that. I, I completely agree with you, right? We are in this period right now. The Army has just, uh, in an AROC about two months ago now, approved the abbreviated capabilities document for predictive logistics, right? And in there, it not only is, you know, the, the requirements for maintenance, but class three, class five, and class nine, right? So being predictive in how we are executing maintenance um, is, is the piece that would absolutely relate towards this. And as you look at it, right, the, it, the Army now has the requirement that's written. This is a huge step. We've been talking about predictive logistics for a long time without the requirement that was written. Okay, and so we will move forward in, in that uh, process, and I agree with you. But I also think that we don't have to censor everything. Right? There is data, you know, kind of linking back into what General Rainey was talking about this morning, there is data that is available out there, and if we get our data properly set, we can visualize and see maintenance issues before they happen. Imagine a BCT going out on a mission, and they can say, in my platforms, you know, I, I only need um, you know, two battalions, and in these two battalions, I'm going to select these two battalions because these two battalions have the greatest readiness rate, but also a predicted readiness rate, or imagine that you could say, I need to change out you know, these four parts on these seven vehicles, and then I will have an operational profile that will support my mission from a maintenance standard. That is the vision that we can go to and achieve. Um, and I think we can only get there if we, uh, we do this together, and that's why I'm asking in this year. So thanks for reinforcing it with the censoring piece. Um, you know, in the sustainment community, and, and not to take this way outside of, of the focus area here, right? if you think about how you consider when a round is consumed, the clarity after it's released from either an ASP um, is not seen until after a range. right? The same as we do it in an operational environment. When that round is first issued, Unless you have a log cop that is doing automatic tracking or a system that tells you when that round is fired, you have 
very limited accuracy in knowing what class 5 actually is on the battlefield at the time. In the log cops that we have of the past, you know, 24 hour delays and so on, um, it didn't give the sustainers the clarity that they needed in order to enable operations on the battlefield and get it to the right place. Um, if you go back to PCC 2 and PCC 3, uh, that was the time when we started to talk about sensor to shooter being actually sensor to shooter to sustainer. Right? What if when that round was fired on the battlefield, industry could know that? Our organic industrial bases could know that. And you could actually have that round start to be produced because you had accurate information about the target that was acquired by that shooter actually fired what specific round and now needed to be replenished. That is the precision that I think that our Army needs and deserves, especially with the precision munitions that we have in the future. We cannot afford the number of rounds that we will need to place, the magazine depths that will be required, um, and so we have to be absolutely precise with what we do in the future. So from a maintenance perspective, Class 3, Class 5, Class 9, I think are our greatest opportunities uh, to work together. Any other questions? Hi, ma'am. Uh, Jim Kincaid from Accenture. Thanks. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Sir Major. Um, as you alluded to, uh, as the Army um, considers other fleets to roll into the program, what parts of the Army are doing those analytics for you? So from the perspective of what we've done already here, um, the answer is we used our NCOMP and low usage program. Uh, but we have very limited fleets who were able to be enrolled in those programs. Uh, what we um, have done in the M1, M2 is we are looking specifically at the G Army data that has been collected uh, just because it's a, a very limited scale and scope and we have the capability to do that. Um, I don't know the answer from the way forward yet. Right? We, we have, uh, you know, we thought we were going to stop with this, but now we're looking at what's in the realm of possible. And so what we see in sense in the G Army for the M1s and M2s can lead us to um, the insight of what maybe we can do in the realm of possible about looking across multiple fleets simultaneously rather than an exception to policy coming in and we work through you know, the, the, the holistic piece. So I owe you better answers on that about what the way towards the future is um, and, and, and so a bit more to follow. And just, to, just to add that we have definitely had the life cycle management commands are very uh, much tied into it, so we're not doing it in a vacuum. And then, you know, we ensure that we have our senior warrant officers for each specific field uh, who have years of experience on that technical side to ensure we're looking at it and then the manufacturers. So ensuring that we have all subject matter experts in the same room. We are being cautious on weapon systems, as I talked about, you know, the M1 and M2, just the platform versus the weapon system. We're also being very specific um, in the realm of aviation for obvious reasons. Uh, AMCOM is just doing an incredible work. They are actually reaching forward to industry to, to look at the data um, from you know industry's perspective and, and, and using that rather than looking backward into the G-Army data, which may or may not have errors in it, right? We've got to do a lot of the cleansing of the data in G-Army, whereas from an industry perspective, sometimes the data is a whole lot more clean. And uh, you know, AMCOM is, is doing a lot from a lifecycle management command. Thanks, for Sergeant Major, for bringing that one up. I forgot about that. Hi, I'm Gina Cavalier from Army Magazine. Um, for the for for the uninitiated, can you loop this initiative back to R two E and how this will help formations get to one hundred percent? Yes. So as you think about the USR, right, when we rate our units, we use the P, the S, the R, and the T. So the personnel, the supply rating, the uh, um, uh, readiness rating of the equipment, and then the training level. Right. So if you see reductions in your personnel, quite often, um, and you know, I've not done a study to, to actually do a correlation or a causation, but if you have less personnel to maintain your equipment, then you are going to have the equipment readiness rates lower. 
they, it just happens, right? The, the less people to maintain means you're going to, and, and specific MOSs actually have a direct impact too, okay? There in uh, the USR, when you calculate your, your training rating, it has to do with specific people in the formation. Are they present for training? Did you accomplish your training objectives? How did you do them? And, and there's direct measures that you, you must apply. And so the training rate also can fall based upon your personnel ratings. The one that usually is not affected is the supply rating, right? And so, you know, the, it's either the equipment is there or it's not there, right? It's, it's, it's less dependent on the personnel. And so that piece of what AMC is doing in the rapid reduction of equipment is ensuring that the equipment they do have is what they're supposed to have and not a lot of excess so that it doesn't require not only the soldiers to maintain that equipment, but also the maintainers to conduct their task in the, in the, in the, the maintenance community. Um, if anyone has ever been a company commander in this room, anyone? What is the most emotional thing that you sometimes, or that you always do as a company commander? Inventory, okay? Company commander hand receipts have grown oversized, right? in the component of end items, the BII that is associated with it, right? They have to be unburdened from the equipment that is excess. The stuff we accumulated over 20 years of conflict for all the right reasons. The stuff that we bought as uh, commercial off the shelf that then entered onto their MTOs that is not required equipment going forward, okay? And so if you want to affect um, change and keep the units at their most optimal levels in the times when our formations are not at 100%, we have to look at the, the S rating, we have to look at the R rating, because those two are both impacted, and I think that's uh, the, the best way to relate it. And if I may add that we are not in any way planning to reduce the maintainer numbers at any of the organizations, it's just refocusing their efforts into readiness versus uh, you know things that we really feel that weren't bringing that readiness, nor are they increasing the risk in a battlefield. All right, I think we have time for one more question or we can close early, whatever the audience desires. All right, I heard no questions, so that means we either answered them all or uh, we, we've uh, got some deep thinking to do, but uh, we look forward to uh, working not only with industry, but our international partners, our life cycle management commands. This is a problem we can solve together to continue to unburden our soldiers and I thank you for what you do each and every day to uh, assist in that effort. Sergeant Major and I will be here for the next day and a half, uh, so uh, please, if you have questions, catch us uh, as we do our industry visits later today. Thank you. Gentlemen, please welcome General Lieutenant General Varane from Headquarters DAG-9 and Mrs. Mosier from Headquarters AMCG-4. Okay. Hey, good. I think it's still morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Hey, so, uh, so I am General Varane. I'm the uh, Headquarters Department of Army G-9. And uh, to, today, I think we've got about 30 minutes to really talk. Okay. All right. Uh, to really talk uh, some uh, some of the things that we're doing um, across the Army. So what does the G9 do? And I'm just going to uh, spend about uh, just uh, one minute to kind of talk a little bit from the enterprise standpoint um, at Headquarters DA. 
Uh, so my primary responsibility is really uh, when it's coming uh, involves the budgeting portion for the Army when it comes to our infrastructure. Um, it's part of the uh, planning, budgeting, execution, programming uh, cycle that we do uh, across the Army and, and that is really where I spend most of my time. And these requirements come from all across the Army. I'm not going to jump into what AMC is probably going to talk about, but uh, the requirements come in from all across the Army and there's a prioritization that has to occur. And, and then all that is basically given to the Army G9 um, to figure out how do we fund it, and especially when you think about uh, budgets and what the Army has uh, to spend. And, and so that's where I spend most of my time is ensuring that requirements come into the, the, uh, the building, into the Pentagon, and we're figuring out how we budget. Uh, I do want to say that I think this corner is important because uh, I know the, the focus for um, AUSA in this aspect, it really gets into our war fighting capability and, and some of the things that we need to do in order to be able to stay victorious on the battlefield. But if we don't um, really take care of our families and our soldiers uh, and having quality infrastructure, uh, then we won't be able to man the equipment that we're trying to acquire, trying to build. And so I just want to put a plug out for that because uh, at the end of the day, it's really about our soldiers and families in order to still have the Army that remains strong. And so that's really uh, something that we all need to, to really understand and know. And I know we know that, but we can't forget about it uh, because uh, we can have the greatest material and equipment, but if we don't have the people manning it, uh, then we won't have an effective Army. I'm going to pass it over to uh, to my Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Perry, uh, and he's going to say a few remarks, and then we're just going to pass it down, and then we're going to open it up for question and answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. So I am Michael Perry. I have the privilege of serving as a G9 SAR Major. I've been in this position for about two years. Uh, you know, and what I love about being a SAR Major, not necessarily in the Pentagon, but as a part of the G9, is, you know, bringing a senior non-commissioned officer's perspective. I'm a career sustainer and logistician, and so bringing all that experience and that perspective really from the tactical and the operational level as I'm advising and making recommendations, you know, to uh, General Vereen, the SMA, other Army senior leaders on how to maximize our resources is where I feel I can bring value. And then the key is relationships. And so, you know, uh, outside the Pentagon, obviously our partnership with AMC and MCOM, and then inside the building is ASA, IE&E, G9, USACE, you know, we kind of call it the big five of the installation enterprise. The more synergy and synchronization that we can create and, and flatten comms and eliminate some of them stovepipes really helps us maximize uh, the resources that we have in order to achieve, again, effects and outcomes to better our Army, quality of life, soldiers and families. And so looking forward to your questions and uh, with that I'll turn it over to Ms. Mosier. Okay, good, uh, good morning everyone. Um, can we go to the next slide please? So, my name is Renee Mosier. I am the Army Material Command G4. To my side is my Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Wyndham. He is my senior um, enlisted advisor. Um, so, as General Vereen has stated, one of the key elements of readiness is quality of life for our soldiers. Um, as we talk about quality of life, uh, you know, there's a lot and the news today in regards to some of the specific areas within the G4 that we have oversight of. I'm going to touch upon a few of those and then I want to turn it over to Sergeant Major Wyndham so he can make some remarks. Just a little bit on AMC, Army Material Command. You can see at the top of the slide, I'm not going to read the slide, the mission and vision of AMC. AMC, we are 165,000 civilians contractors, government employees strong. It's a large, vast organization. There's not a, co a camp, post, or station in the, United, in the United States, CONUS and OCONUS, that we don't touch. Having said that, the oversight of our, uh, our barracks, our facilities, our housing, our food service for our service members, is a critical component of what we do um, within Army Material Command, partnering very closely with the G9 partners uh, that you see here today. General Vereen talked about the budget. We like to spend his money. And so I think we do that pretty well. 
And so, uh, again, uh, what we want to leave time for is a, a large amount of time today for questions. So I'm going to turn it over to my Sergeant Major, and then we're going to open it up. Good morning, everyone. So, like Ms. Mosier said, um, you know, we focus on quality of life. And one of the initiatives that we're working on on the AMC G4 is revolutionizing how we feed our soldiers. Um, we're looking at, you know, working with industry. How is industry feeding, you know, college students and trying to mirror uh, that, that, uh, that portfolio? Um, we're trying to give soldiers flexible feeding options to meet them at the point of need. You know, we have kiosks now, we have food trucks. Um, all those different things to give soldiers access to healthy options. Uh, so looking forward to your questions that you may have um, that we can feel and give you that clarity. Okay. Sir, you want to open up for questions? All right. We're ready. All right. I know we got questions out there. Um, Gina Cavallaro with Army Magazine. Uh, Sergeant Major, you just mentioned revolutionizing, revolutionizing how you feed your soldiers. Can you uh, go go give us some bullet points on some of the bigger things that we that we can expect to see, or what the big things are that you're looking at? Yes. Yeah, so, so we're looking at we're looking at the, the the installation at the campus, right? So how can we get our soldiers access to food outside of the dining facility? You know, whether they can go to, you know, a food court that's on the installation and be able to use their meal and type of thing. So we're doing some benchmarking sessions with universities to kind of see how they're doing it with their college students. Uh, because our meal card holders uh, on post camps and stations are the 18 to 24 age demographic. So it's the same demographic that you see at colleges and universities. So we're just trying to see how can we meet soldiers at the point of need to give them access, you know, outside of the typical meal hours. Uh, hope that helps. Uh, and we're trying to do that in multiple ways. Uh, we're trying to do it through kiosks. Uh, we have meal prep options uh, that we're giving soldiers where soldiers can have meal preps uh, that are geared to their fitness levels, uh, that are geared to, they can pick these meals up and have three, about three to seven days worth meals that they can take to their barracks rooms and heat them up at a later time to, to subside. And if I could add to that as well. So one thing, uh, before I got to serve in the G9 and do other things for the Army, I got to be a 92 Golf. Uh, and so I'm actually the senior golf in the United States Army. And so I, I wear that as a badge of honor. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, to, your, to your question, ma'am, and it's a great question. And so on top of everything that AMC has shared, one of the things that we're looking at, uh, you know, as the Sergeant Major Wyndham talked about, first, every installation is different. And we cannot have a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. You know, those solutions, you know, probably 10 to 15 years ago, it was primarily our dining facilities or warrior restaurants, right? And as decisions have been made about, you know, uh, you know, a certain capability that's going to be reduced in order to make room for modernization and other capabilities, what we have to collectively do is ensure that from each installation, when you look at it, it's like a food ecosystem. And so we're trying to look at a variety of different um, you know, capabilities, food trucks, kiosks, uh, you know, partnering with DECA. The dining facilities will be a part of that always, but maybe not to the extent uh, that we've had in the past. And so again, it's, it's looking at it holistically and figuring out again, partnering with industry, what are some of those capabilities that are out there that can help ensure that, you know, we're able to feed our soldiers. One of the other challenges that we have in some installations is a lot of our soldiers don't drive. And so when you have a barracks or a motor pool or a working area that is a significant distance from wherever that dining facility is, uh, you know, we've got a pilot right now at Fort Cavazos where we've got a mass transit uh, ICSA, uh, Intergovernmental Support a uh, um, uh, Agreement, with uh, outside the community where they're leveraging, you know, basically a shuttle service that's got an app that gives soldiers an opportunity, almost like ordering an Uber, to be able to help get them to, you know, the warrior restaurants and other things. And so those are some of the things that we're looking at from an Army perspective to ensure that we're maintaining, you know, a high quality of life, which ultimately we know is going to support recruiting and retention as well. And I'd like to just stop, put stop your last comment. Quality of life is one of the areas in regards to barracks, food, you know, getting after better food, better choices. 
uh, looking at how our unaccompanied um, housing is for our service member. That is a key component to retention and keeping our service members in the in, in service. Hey, I'm Com Command Sergeant Major uh, Mike Connerty, Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, the question I have, we talked about the campus style dining. What are some of the, the technological barriers to, to you know, soldiers getting the BAH, uh, BAS, uh, to being able to go anywhere with APs or DECA? What's some of the things the Army's doing with that, uh, maybe with industry that will work on the solutions in the background so we truly can have BAS being able to use across an installation? Can you speak to that? Yes, that's a good question. So it's, it's really a, about a three-pronged approach that, that we're working right now. Uh, one of the areas, as uh, the Sergeant Major spoke about, we are partnering with um, industry in regards to getting after, um, as we're looking out across our formations and the Army, in regards to how we are managing food service holistically. So that's one of the areas that, that we're, we've been taking uh, a significant look. We have sent a team, an assessment team to every installation to assess food service and talking, we're, uh, we've been doing surveys, talking to the service member and getting feedback on what they're looking for. So that's one of the areas that we've been working over the last three months. The second area, uh, we've been looking from a system approach and how we can take um, the, uh, the food service system called AFMIS and how we can utilize technology and um, have that service member be able to take their CAC card and go to AFES, go to the commissary. Uh, we're looking uh, at those partnerships between AFES and DECA. Uh, again, opening up the aperture because that's one of the, the feedback we have received from the service member. They want choices. And, uh, and then the, the other um, area that we're taking a hard look at is regard is to the food itself and being used. We're looking real hard at quality and choices for our service members as uh, as they go through, uh, you know, the food line. It's not just a matter of. Uh, it's also atmosphere. We're looking at the atmospherics of the dining experience, and uh, you know, the barracks. Uh, I'm sorry, the service members today, as you know, I've previously stated. They want choices. They want to. They want grab and go. They want DoorDash, and so those are all the areas that we're taking a hard look at and, and be able to provide that to our service members. I hope that answers your question. Good morning, ma'am. Sorry, Major. First one, low from five nineteenth out of Fort Liberty. Um, on the topic of barracks and and food. So we still live in some barracks from like early 90s where rooms are small, there's no kitchenettes. Uh, even in the common area, there's, there's no common kitchen. Um, I know barracks are looking to go privatized here in the near future. Is that something you guys can touch on as far as, is there, is there um, uh, a way to, or is there a, a way to look at uh, standardizing the coding for all the barracks across the board or you know is it like kind of the haves and have nots and then the second part to that is for quality of life um i know the navy is doing a pilot program right now of adding wi-fi like free wi-fi into the barracks is that something you guys are looking at across the board as well so i'll take a pitch at this and then sir i'll i'll send it over if you want to take it first okay oh, okay uh your first question in regards to the rooms and kitchens and a, a standardized. So yes, that is a task working very closely with headquarters DAG9 and our IE and E teammates. Uh, we are looking at a standardized template for barracks. Uh, it's something that we uh, will be discussing. We're, we're going to have another barracks summit at the end of April, and that is something that the SMA of the Army is uh, working very closely with the team here. Uh, very long uh, response to your question, but yes, the Army is looking at standardization, uh, but understanding as we go through um, the MILCOM process, um, you know, it could take a while to get to, you know, every post camping station in, in, the, in the Army today, uh, but that uh, that's where we're headed with uh, the standardized barracks. Sir, anything you want to add? No, uh, so, uh, no, great. That's, uh, that's good. 
So what, what we've uh, uncovered is we have uh, a variety of different barracks types in the Army. And each one of them costs um, a full range of, of money. It's, it's, it's amazing. But um, what we're trying to do is really become more efficient. And if we can get to a barracks room standard, what should be in a barracks room um, for our soldiers, to include how we house them. Do we, do, um, do we have um, roommates or do we go with single rooms? I mean, all that's it's going to be uh, sort of uh, finalized here in the next couple of months. But uh, we know that uh, we want to be able to have uh, the, the amenities that a soldier needs in order to live in our barracks. But we also know that there's, uh, there's cost savings when you have a few standards. And, and that way, as the engineers are trying to put Milcon products together, there is not so many uh, uh, varied cost that come in, come into play. So that's from a from an efficiency standpoint, financial efficiency standpoint. The other piece is yes, we are looking at Wi-Fi. Um, there's a couple other options and things that we're trying to look at uh, to be able to um, provide for our soldiers. Uh, it, I think it's going to it'll be great. I know some of the other services are a little bit ahead of us. The Air Force already has a contract for Wi-Fi. I think the Navy does as well. Um, and so we're looking at options as, uh, with that as well. Now again. You know, as uh, Ms. Moser said, you know, construction is, is really the long pole in a tent. It really takes a, quite a bit of time to get a building built in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Department of Defense. It's just the fact of life. Uh, we have, it takes about five years for us to even, um, you know, the funding portion, portion has to be done, and then we actually break ground, and then, of course, almost 24 months later, you'll actually see a building. So you can kind of put that time together, and, and it's about a five-year plan. We wish we could get faster. We are making some uh, other arrangements to get faster, and Congress has given us some some, some different authorities as well uh, to be able to try to drive um, the ability to be able to do things a little bit faster. But faster and good, not faster and bad. So we, we got to balance how we build. So. Just to add on to that as well, uh, one of the things at Fort Story that we just did, uh, so we added kitchens. We added kitchens at Fort Story where soldiers can come down and, and, and cook you know, their meals, prepare them themselves. Uh, but what we're looking at in the future with the barracks, especially, you know, is to have a kiosk inside of the barracks, right, where a soldier can come down and get food. Because we're trying to cause those collision points, right, get soldiers out of the room where they can talk to other soldiers. And how you can do that is cause those collision points, whether it's a kitchen, kitchenette, or it's a kiosk, that, that'll cause that, that collision point with them. My name is Rod Penny. Well, I'm with Caliber Systems. Thank you all for being here. It's been a great discussion. General Vereen, this question is for you particularly. If we go back from, uh, we go back to like last year when the Secretary, uh, Secretary Wormuth spoke about you know, the, the challenges relative to barracks and quality of installation. If you don't mind, sir, could you speak on, from your vantage point, how long do you see it's going to take us, us, the Army, get to a place where when we go to recruit and when our quality of life and we're maintaining our, our our workforce that quality of life issue isn't a disparity between say us and the Air Force for example can you talk about how long is it going to take us to get to a place where that's not a discussion anymore I know that's a larger question uh, that's great um, I, so uh, I'll first start off by saying nothing is easy to fix in, in our field. And, and it's all the other services you know, when you have a, a very con, uh, constrained budget and, and you have certain timelines and, you know, and you, you think about our MILCON, I'll just you know, frame an example. We can't even give the, the uh, Corps of Engineers all of our projects at one time. They, they can only do but so much a year. And, and so those are the things I think that we're challenging. Now, I, I will say that what we've done over the last few months is we have made a conscious decision to fix all of our quality three and four barracks across the Army. We, we really didn't have that plan before this, before four or five months ago. Um, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief have been committed to invest our money into fixing quality three and four. And so what is quality three and four barracks? What, what are they? I mean, those are our, our, the worst barracks we have in the Army. And so over time, we've been using sustainment dollars to, to basically kind of just limp our way through. Um, and those sustainment dollars can be used for other things. That, you know, commanders are trying to make hard decisions on the ground. We've now fenced money where we're literally taking um, a large portion of our budget to go after three quality three and quality four barracks. And so we are 
we're hoping that we will start to see things change um, next year because now we've made a conscious effort over the FIDEP, meaning that over the next five years, this, these are going to be substantial investments that are going to go after quality three and four barracks. And so um, I feel comfortable that we can change the dynamics now, we can change the landscape, escape, but it's still, it's still going to take time. I, I think that's a welcoming um, you know, decision because now I think we have a, a, a full way forward and we're not doing patchwork trying to use FSRM to be the end-all be-all. And so I, I say that because I am very much concerned, like with all of us, if we don't have quality barracks and we don't have quality work spaces, um, our soldiers are not, they're not gonna be, feel good about wearing our, our uniform. They're, we want them to feel good about joining the Army. We want them to feel good about where they work and where they live, but also where they decide to you know, play uh, in our MWR facilities and things of that nature. So, um, that's our approach, but um, but I think we are we have a good way forward now that we have a strategy with fixing you know really our worst of our worst barracks across the army. Thank you, sir. And if you don't mind, could you also touch on some of the other things we're doing to save costs across you know our army? For example, meter data management or building more efficient and uh, sustainable buildings. Uh, energy, you know, net zero, other things that we can do to lower the cost so that we can apply it more fat, more quickly the, the renovations and the sustainment that you're talking about. Yeah, uh, so I, I will talk, I don't want to steal uh, Honorable Jacobs, Jacobson's thunder. She is really the environmental energy guru, guru and so, uh, but I do play in that space as well like some, all of us do. Um, I think when you, when we're trying to measure um, what we are are spending when it comes to uh, some of the, the energy um, uh, bills that we have across the Army. And we have a sub substantial utility bill across the Army, believe it or not. I mean, we spend a lot of money, and they can vouch for it, on, on our utilities. Some of it is because we have infrastructure that we probably don't need, but we also have inf infrastructure that's probably in such a state of re uh, condition that it's requiring additional energy to be able to heat and cool them. So. We, I think we've identified that through some of the, the, the building um, uh, research that we've been able to, to, to update our data to understand where we have really bad buildings and things of that nature. So, so we're going to divorce ourselves of buildings we don't need. That's the first thing. We're going we're gonna to divorce us. And that will lower, I think, our utility bill and, and, and the other expenditures that we're having across the Army. What we are also looking at is we're looking at um, energy efficient buildings themselves. Um, and most of our new construction, when we start to build new barracks, we're going to focus on them being uh, more energy efficient uh, and not uh, costing us a lot of money when we build them. And we just we just can't sustain them because the, the bills are too high. Um, so so that's an area we're looking at. Um, I do want to foot stomp um, the ICSAs, and I know Sergeant Major talked about it. But every time we can cost share with the community is a good thing. Um, we are we are doing that uh, across the Army. As a matter of fact, the Army leads all the other services with. Ixes, and that's a great thing uh, as we look at a win-win situation for the community that we're surrounded by, but also the community themselves. And so um, I think that's a great thing. Microgrids, um, we are, we're building microgrids all across our military installations. I do, almost every installation I've been to either has a microgrid um, structure or is in the process of getting one. I was at Liberty uh, a couple of months ago. They have one, uh, it's, it's powering both. Um, uh, for uh, Liberty in some areas, some of our, our places there, but it's also Pinehurst is using some of it as well, so Southern Pine. So so we have some great projects ahead. I think we just got to continue, continue the, the uh, you know, the uh, the pace at which we want to get this done. And, and, and it's going to be a win-win, I think, for us and for uh, when, when you look at our budgets as well across the Army. So hopefully I answered it, but there's a lot of things that we're doing, um, and, uh, and I think we're really excited about the way ahead as well. And we're going to we're actually going to cut our new uh, energy strategy, climate strategy here uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we, the secretary should be where she can, uh, she feels comfortable signing it. But, but that's going to give us a great uh, leverage as well when we have some document that we're operating on. Thanks. Hi, hi there. Um, my name is Melissa Hadley. I'm with EY's Human Capital Practice. And I've heard a lot over the last day and a half about how Army is working to become a data-driven organization. I'm curious about how you are using, or collecting and using data about the soldier experience 
to inform some of the decisions that you're making. So what are the, how are we sort of listening to our soldiers, asking them what they're thinking and feeling and expecting, um, and measuring that up against what we're actually delivering? All right, you, Renee, you want to start? Because I do have an answer for you. No, go ahead. using data in a lot of different venues uh, for housing for instance we are in the right now we're doing the housing tenant survey for privatized housing and so that is uh, a survey that goes to all the uh, tenants and the housing that is managed by our RCI partners and you know survey specific questions how well are the RCI partners doing in regards to privatized housing so that's one of the means that we uh, we have in regards to getting feedback from the service member and their families in this case in regards to how well we are doing uh, in, in housing for our company service members uh, other ways that we're using data is um, as we go through and we make the determination in regards to, you know, General Vereen, you mentioned the cost of buildings. And so we're using the data in regards to our cost, in regards to MILCON and our, uh, our MILCON and our r &M projects, and looking at the cost and how over the years how cost trends are increasing and how we can bring those costs down. And so that's one of the other areas that we're taking a hard look at um, to help uh, stabilize the cost from a housing and barracks perspective. And we're also using data in regards to food, uh, as, as we spoke about earlier. Uh, we have several surveys. Um, as we hit every, every uh, installation, we, we put surveys out uh, through a, a, it was a Q code a QR code and so we're using data in that respect in regards to what the service member uh, desires are from food um, as we go through. So those are three examples I, I can provide. Yeah. Sir? So, um, no, those are great. We, uh, I think we are, we, we try to manage surveys um, within uh, some sort of level of reasoning because we know we get survey fatigue um, and, uh, and sometimes we don't necessarily get the response rates that we want. I think the other, the critical aspect to all of how we try to take data that we get across the Army is really we rely on our, um, our leaders to talk to our soldiers. And, and I think that is absolutely probably the most um, empirical, unfiltered, um, unedited data that we can get. And, and so when you think about whether it's what, what types of food we like, are the defects, do you, you know, eat from the defects? You know, do you want a roommate? Um, all those different things that we are really trying to solve um, across the Army, we really have to rely on leaders asking our soldiers questions. The first thing we always do is, um, what are our soldiers saying and how are, we, how are we getting that information? We would want leaders to be able to talk to soldiers. And I think that is, and then we take this data and we, we, uh, we somehow synthesize it so it makes some sort of sense and then we have to drive it for some decision. And I, and I said about room configurations and you know what soldiers want, a lot of that information came from, well it came from a survey, but it also came from us just asking our soldiers, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you prefer? What, do, what would you like? Um, because we wanna make sure that we hear our soldiers uh, that are out there in the field. And, and so I think you know, good leadership matters, it really does. Good morning. My name is Jason McClare. I'm the AUSA chapter president at Fort Eisenhower. And uh, I think an easy win for you all, uh, as far as good news, is the Installation Management Command has this thing called the Army Maintenance App. And if you could talk to some of the successes of that, and I think also that data feeds into the previous question of how you're managing the expectations of soldiers and how you're responding to their demands. Thank you. You're referring to my Army app. Make sure I have the right app. Is that correct? It is the Arma Arma app. The Arma app. So you, I'm not that familiar with the Arma app. Yes. Yeah, so so you're, you're you're absolutely right. Um, 
and, and we're taking that data from from the ARMA. Uh, one of the things uh, I don't know if you if you read the the new NDAA language, um, it, 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 it's mandating us to have barracks managers uh, that are going to be civilians, right? That can dedicate their full time to make sure that they're taking that data that's coming out of the ARMA and actually applying it and, and fixing those those issues uh, that we're seeing in ARMA. Uh, as you know now. The soldier, the green suitor, is managing that, that that process, right? And just not doing a good job at it, right? Because we have a lot of other things that they're doing to include their war fighting mission. So with the NDAA um, giving us the authority to hire these civilian uh, employees to manage that system, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, great um, uh, momentum to get it, get it where it needs to be. Yeah. I'll put a plug out for my Army app. I can go ahead and talk about it real quick. Uh, the Army is going to my Army app. That's going to be the app, the app that uh, that really where every installation is going to be separate and distinct. It's going to have specific information about that specific installation. Uh, for instance, what gates are closed and when they're closed. So you won't be going through a you know, gate that's already closed like I do sometimes. It's uh, And not knowing the hours when it closes. Um, those are the things that are going to be specific to that installation where you can go. It's going to be all on one. Uh, one central sort of uh, platform you can you know, do, use it on your mobile devices, um, but we uh, we have a mo we have a variety of different applications out there, and and right now a lot of them are not talking to one another. So we're going to centralize that. It's going to be under one app, uh, and it'll be a, a really a plethora of information that you can find that's available that's specifically tied to uh, that installation. So we're excited about it. Uh, it's been Yeoman's work with MCOM, AMC, and of course folks in the building, our G6 CIO and folks. So um, so we're excited about it, but um, that's forthcoming. We're building it now. So. All right, I think I'm getting a hook. All right. I'll be available for questions if you if you have them, anything on the sidebar. All right, so we can always talk to you. Foley, don't ask me no crazy questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sir.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, in the Warriors Corner. Our next topic, Sustainment Data Analytic Education, Army Sustainment University, Cash Time and Trade Off. Uh, Mr. Myers, who's the interim president for Army Sustainment University, and Lieutenant Colonel Dreyer is the instructor. Both will be presenting at 11.45. Thank you.
good offer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. Uh, we will get started in probably one minute. If you would please assemble and take a seat. And uh, we'll start momentarily. Welcome uh, from the Army Sustainment University, Mr. Myers, who's the interim president, and Lieutenant Colonel Justin Dwyer, who's an instructor, and they're I'm going sorry. to talk to you about sustainment data analytics education. Please join us in a round of applause. All right, here we go. So, hey, good morning. Uh, as, as he mentioned, I'm Rick Myers, the interim president of Army Sustainment University. This is J.J. Dwyer. He's the chairman of the Operational Research Systems Analysis Committee. And uh, it's quite an opportunity to come here today to talk to you guys about our data education strategy. And so super excited uh, for the conversation and we'll dig into some details. But before we kick it off, I think it's really important to help you guys understand what Army Sustainment University is. And so when you look across training and doctrine command, no other COE has this university structure such as us. And so I just want to spend a minute or two talking about that structure and then we'll jump into to the data aspect of it. And so about 25,000 students across the, uh, across the Army, the uh, intergovernmental agencies and international and joint communities 
uh, cross through our campus annually. And it's a, it's a pretty unique environment where we cover the entire spectrum from 01 through 06, W1 through W5, and then E5 through E7. And so I'll talk about that just a bit and then we'll, we'll jump into data. So the Logistics Leader College is where we do initial military training for our officers and our professional military education for our officers. It covers three branches, Quartermaster Transportation and Ordnance. We have the Technical Logistics College that covers 15 of the 19 sustainment warrant officer specialties, W1 through W5, so initial military training and then the professional military education as well. And then we have uh, the Logistics Non-Commissioned Officer Academy, which is 44 enlisted MOSs from across the sustainment community. And then we have this unique organization that JJ is part of, which is the College of Applied Logistics and Operational Sciences. And they're really functional in nature with a tad bit of PME. And so if you look at, uh, at what his, his organization does, it's uh, functional forces on behalf of TRADOC. Uh, so if you think the GCSS Army Middle Managers course, the Support Operations course, um, it, you know, those functional areas that are in addition to PME, they also touch on uh, partnership courses, and that's really that bottom, uh, my left, your right-hand side, where we teach courses, where we actually develop and teach courses on behalf of numerous partners. And so AMC, for example, um, you know, we, we teach supply chain optimization and multiple other, other courses on their behalf. The Department of Army G8, we teach the ORSA MAC and ORSA Functional course on their behalf. Uh, Army Civilian Career Management Activity, we teach data analysis and visualization, and then multiple courses for the logistics career management field that focuses on Department of Army civilians. So if I were going to explain ASU in a single sentence, I would tell you guys that it's the education arm of the Combined Armed Support Command and the Sustainment Center of Excellence. A unique organization, but a pretty powerful one. So I don't tell you that story to tell the ASU story, which I, I obviously love doing, but I tell you that to, to highlight the opportunities that exist within the, the, in the education realm. And so uh, about two years ago, the SEC Army released her objectives, and uh, number two was, was make the Army more data-centric. And so we took that quite serious, and we jumped in a room, and we threw a whiteboard up, and we talked about how do we get there, how do we achieve that, and why is it important. And I don't think there's any argument that we could say the sustainment community is one of the largest producers and uh, consumers of data. And in our case, you look at just our information systems, IPSA, GCSS Army, and GFIBS. No shortage of data impacts every organization across the force. And so we recognized that data was absolutely critical to uh, uh, really getting after I know we talk about precision logistics a lot, but precision sustainment too, because it's about replacing those, uh, those personnel on the battlefield just as much as anything else. And so what JJ is going to talk to you about is the, our data education strategy. And so this team came together, put together a white paper that really did the analysis of why data is important and then they jumped in a little bit a uh, little bit deeper and tried to understand how we how we address it you know I found this an interesting fact and JJ may talk about it but when we did the analysis we looked at lo uh, logistics officers and 55 percent of the logistics officers that joined the force have a business or criminal justice degree the last math class or data class that they took was was quite honestly college level algebra very few had statistics very few had any uh, uh, stem background and so we had to look at an education strategy that considered all of that so we have the, the those that are that are really deep into it self-studied or even you know educated and those that have very little understanding of data and so the combined arms center under the command of general beagle really got after data literacy and that was what he wanted to attack so what jj is about to share with you is something a little bit more deeper than uh, uh data literacy all right, so as uh, Rick said, I'm Lieutenant Colonel J.J. Dwyer. I'm an ORSA in the Army, and ORSA is a Operations Research Systems Analysis. So we're not actually part of logistics field, uh, although we reside inside the university. Uh, we're taught through G8 as our proponent, and that's where we look we'll at our schooling, and we teach the PME there, we teach the basic PME where we come through and become an ORSA, and as well as the advance as a major uh, in, promo in promoting to Lieutenant Colonel. So as we do that, uh, we're just part of the university, so they, they were able to help out with the research and be able to figure out what we really needed. Um, so the university looked at, they asked us to look at, we did a survey where we asked senior leaders, uh, former battalion commanders, former brigade commanders, all the way down to E6s, E5s, right? Whoever in the school, I think it was 186 uh, total people we surveyed, and we asked what they, what they felt they were comfortable with with data analysis, and most of them weren't. 
as, uh, as Mr. Myers pointed out, only about 10% actually had a true STEM degree, although it may say Bachelor of uh, Sciences, you know what I mean? It's not really the sciences are kind of weak in there. So it's really to be able to do that data analysis, uh, we want to be able to assist in that. So we're not trying to turn all these uh, logistics officers and logistics NCOs into ORSAs, right? We're working with decision sciences. How can we make decisions better using some of that data and help leaders out? But we're not trying to turn all these young lieutenants and captains and, and E6s into, into ORSAs. We're just trying to help them make better decisions for their commanders on the ground. Sir, could you hit up the next slide, please? Is that working out here? Give me one more, please. Uh, so here's what we talk about when we talk about decision uh, data-centric environment. Um, so most of the things you'll see inside of a command or inside of a structure with analysis is you're going to see a whole lot of graphs. And most of it is what we call descriptive. It's what already happened, right? You're going to put up a bar graph about what's on hand, what happened yesterday, what happened the day before. And if the data is up to date, it might be what's today. But as we most, as we really know it's usually a couple days old, you know, 12 to 24 hours old, right? It's not that snapshot that you can see instantaneously. So we want to be able to help with that and even get that picture a little bit better. Right? That's something very simple you can do is just put up some colors, be able to talk about it. Right? It's a starting point. And that's okay. It's a great starting point. We're going to be able to talk from there and maybe be able to allude some things that we can use in the future. We're trying to get everyone all the way up to that you know, prescriptive type level. We're, it's, it's a hard work to get there. So you notice that graph at the top, every time you do this, it takes a little bit more time, a little bit more data, and a little bit more knowledge to be able to do this. So we're going to start to be able to build that program as we go through. So we're moving up to the diagnostic, as you saw, you see a lot of dashboards, right? That's the new thing, especially with Power BI or those kind of buzzwords, right? We can put up a dashboard to see, hey, what's our status right now? It's cool, it's great. It's be able to show the commander instantaneously where the force is at so they can make decisions, right? So be able to build those type of skills and know where to reach inside of GSS Army, make a data connection into that data lake, as we call it, right? And be able to grab that data instantly and create a picture for the commander so they can make a good decision and be able to move the force forward. The next thing we'll look about is predictive, right? So what's going to happen next, right? We'll be able to use some forecasting, uh, some words, you know, the regression, some of those things where we're optimizing, where we're going to be able to figure out what's going to happen next. And that's where we're teaching these lieutenants just a little bit, like there's some things already built inside of Excel, they can click a couple buttons, hopefully they'll understand the output, and that's our goal is to help teach them to be able to understand what's going on from there. And then eventually, the, obviously the biggest goal is to be predictive about it. We talk about this especially in force on force with, uh, let's say, fuel artillery. And we're ready to move from different operations, go from offensive to defensive. How about we're, predict we're, we're more prescriptive and we say, hey, get a flat rack ready with all the ammo we need for defense, right? We're planning that out. We're optimizing that flat rack. We're setting it up with all the smoke, setting it up with that, um, with the landmines, with it, be able to set up inside there and get it ready for that future operation two days later. Because we're thinking ahead, we're not just talking about just what happened. So even the mindset changing, besides just throwing up those graphs, thinking about data and how, what's going to impact that data and what's going to be able to affect in the future. So that's what we're trying to build inside the university. Can you the next slide, sir? So on the right side, that's what we started to build. We, we took it back and we, after we did that survey, we found out what was actually needed inside the community. Uh, we started to build a couple different levels of training. So far, the first two levels are complete, right? We have level one, the foundational, which is 16 hours of training, 18 hours total with an uh, in-test and an out-test to see if we actually achieve the goal that we wanted to. And that's inside our, currently inside our lieutenant's course. Uh, so they come in, we just started that last fall, and they'll be able to pull in through there. So we're sending 150 lieutenants at a time through this course, and we're being able to get them some sort of data analysis. Our primary mode of instruction is Excel, right? Because guess what? Every government computer you open is going to have Excel on it, right? If you don't use any sort of GWIS software, and then they get there, they're going to have to do purchasing, they're going to have to do contracting, right? So we're trying to get down to the basis where every officer is going to be able to use that and use that kind of stuff for the future. And then we have our intermediate where we move up into the captains. Uh, so the captains get an intermediate where they get 40 hours of training, right? They actually get a lot of training. They get some stuff where uh, really talk about data visualization, talk about some true analysis, and be able to figure out what kind of decisions they can help make for the commander. Uh, so that now 40 hours of training, it's the, currently the first 16 hours is what the lieutenants are getting because we haven't caught up to that model, right? The lieutenants have just started. We can't start way ahead in that 16 hours before they get it too. Eventually, next three years, we'll move that 40 hours into something a little bit deeper because they have that baseline when they come through as lieutenant. But until then, the first 16 is just that same stuff the lieutenants are getting, and then they build on top of that. 
And then we're hoping to move forward to an advanced level, to a level three, right? For those support operations officers and those staff officers to really dig deep inside it, using, you know, at the headquarters and PACOM and UCOM and all those kind of stuff, where they're really digging in deep to figure out what they can use with this data analysis and throughput and ships and optimization, where they can build their strengths inside that. So that's that's the next step is where we're going. But right now we currently have those two going inside the, the officers. And along with the officers, we're not just gonna stop there. We're looking to go to the NCOs and warrant officers, but that's a little bit more difficult because each one of those MOSs is a different length of time, is a different length, you know, different field you're looking at, different systems of records. So each each one of those things is taking a little more time, right? The, the lieutenants and captains were blanket. It was a lot easier to be able to cover those quickly. But now it's digging into course by course, really, as we start digging into each AOC or MOS for those uh, NCOs and warrant officers. So we'll continue to build that as we go. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, so when you look at the, the BOLIC and the lieutenants and the captain career course in particular, uh, they're not necessarily all standalone courses. And so what we tried to do was incorporate it or what we would call integrated training. They're already in those systems of records. So let's not take let's take advantage of those systems of records and highlight the opportunities for them to pull data so that's a real life experience and then we have some of our other uh, current and near-term goals that we're working with. We actually have some partnerships uh, with VCU and with the uh, University of South Carolina that we currently send some lieutenants to for a year to go get some, or the captains, excuse me, to get some actual data training. They go and get a degree, get a certificate, and be able to come back into the force. So it's one of those things you would talk about as an exchange in ACS where they go send a year and come back to the force with a little bit of knowledge. We're just trying to put it inside for everyone to get a little bit of that flavor where they're going to be the subject matter experts as they go, go forward and they move on. And then we're also trying to get a consolidated um, data platform where we can go get that education, uh, where we can go find all of these catch-ups and, you know, simple where you can do self-development, right? There's a lot of those courses out there that the Army pays for, and we have that partnership with Microsoft and where we can go through and get some of that training on your own if you're not here. And the other thing we're doing is to, to fill out that gap for the lieutenants and the cap captains is uh, we're doing an IMI, which is an interactive media uh, interface where we're going through the education and we're building that uh, that 16 hour foundational course inside an IMI. And that should be available to all Army soldiers and DA civilians, right? So it's not just for us, but it's gonna be a little bit more uh, logistics focused, but we're gonna have that available hopefully uh, in about a year uh, from, from this summer, I think, hopefully uh, summer 25 is the goal to be able to have that built so we can have that so they can they catch up if they miss lieutenants or their branch transfer into logistics field, they can go hit up that IMI and catch up with the rest of their field uh, to be able to go from there. Anything else on this one? I think, uh, you, you know, touching on the IMI portion of it, something else that we've recently done just trying to educate the force is run a data road show as well. And so JJ and his team, Dr. Bill Smith, went out, uh, they spent some time in the G9, uh, the National Guard Bureau and others educating senior leaders who are PME complete uh, on, on data and the importance for them as well. And so we're looking at every opportunity to expand understanding of data and how we can better use it as a sustainment community to be a little bit more precise in operations. Yeah, absolutely. And to echo that point, we, we were able to, it's, it's about four hour training, sometimes we've done two, we did it with the CASCOM headquarters, the G9, and we've done a couple others with the warrant officers, to be able to talk about them and to have them think about what they can ask their subordinates about. That's the biggest thing, like, how do you ask these data-driven questions to be able to get what you desire, right? Not just have that open in a comment, how do we do things better, how can we make it better? Think about that question. We have a SMART acronym that we use, be specific, measurable, all those kind of things, to be able to ask those questions, to be able to drive your force, because we're giving them the skills, now you've got to ask for them to use it, right? I mean, that's the thing. So we're, we're trying to get with those leaders to be able to say, hey, how can your organization build better off of this data centric environment? Next slide. So here are some of the things, uh, data efforts in the field. Uh, the first one up there is a maintenance comm operating picture. It was built by a private and a lieutenant, right? It's at a Power BI where they can be able to build this kind of thing. It pulls up their maintenance cop, right? The common operating picture. And this is a true common operating picture, right? Because when you're logging in, you're getting the same data as somebody else because it's a direct connection to the system, right? That's what we're trying to build inside of there so you can see that common. Whoever opens, it's going to see that same data picture. And it's just two, just Two guys working hard, right, on a staff trying to build this thing, and we're able to pull up all sorts of things to the AOAP, right, with the Army Oil Analysis Program, all these things, and with Power BI, if you haven't not familiar with it, right, it, it's a drillable, as we call it, right? So you can touch those things, get a little bit closer, touch on, it's an interactive briefing, right? It's not a PowerPoint static slide, right? It's something you can actually touch and be able to drive inside. And that's where we can really have those conversations. That's also changing the environment. It's changing those leaders and not just ask for that slide, be able to be okay with asking questions and maybe not being able to answer them on the spot. We can dig into it, we can click on it, we can talk about it, right? This morning there were five 
you know, tanks down, now there's six. Well, what happened, right? We can click in there and find out which bumper number it was because it's live data, and that does happen. We don't need to, you know, stop the quarterly training brief slides a week beforehand because we're too worried about doing that live thing. And being comfortable with it, right? That's a big thing that we're trying to get leaders to be okay with is this thing is it's not always, right? You can't rehearse it for three days ahead of time. It's ready to go right now. So being able to be comfortable with that kind of feeling um, is important for the, for the senior leaders as well as the young ones. And your I was, was going to say it's one of the reasons I think it highlights the importance of data education because a private and a lieutenant did build this, right? And so helping standardize the language, helping standardize the understanding of the material, how to better use it. But what I find interesting with this is the efficiencies that it created. They were spending about eight hours one day a week pulling all this data. It automatically pulls and refreshes twice a day now, right? And so they're not spending that time looking up AOEP, TMD, uh, safety use messages, and, and their readiness rates, right? It's at the tip of their fingertips for anybody to see, quite honestly. Honestly, they gave us access to their site and in comparison a private and a lieutenant built that in the bottom right is the G8 dashboard built by GS15 who went to University of uh, South Carolina program and so they're both accomplishing the same thing one may be more detailed than the other uh, but they're both accomplishing it right and so it's really a testament to that to the skills that we have residing in our force how do we standardize that and help people understand uh, the same concept so all right well, the next slide sir and then here's what the, the reach and impact, right? So how, we kind of started this program originally, kind of as we started building inside of it, we were one of the first ones to really get after it inside of our education. Uh, but then the Mission Command Center of Excellence became the proponent for that data education. Uh, so they're, they're building for the common core, right, for all Army leaders, they're building what they call the data literacy program, right? So that's, this is so everyone can talk the same language. And that's what's really important, right? Use that same, uh, the same words as we're talking, the same understanding to be able to do that. So they're building that literacy portion inside of the common core. Now the hands-on portion, that's then up to each command or uh, center of excellence as they want to do, right? As we talk, logistics uh, individuals have a lot of data at their fingertips. So we're going to make sure we have a lot of hands on stuff. Now the infantry, right, the maneuver center of excellence, they might not too much hands on, right? It may be more like four hours instead of that 16 that we're doing to be able to use that data inside there. So the common core will be built hopefully by, I think it's this, is it uh, next summer? I think is a, is a benchmark. Yeah. yeah, so be able to go through there. So that common core will be built inside of all PME at all levels uh, soon. And then we're gonna do the hands on portion is up to each individual COE. Um, center of Excellence. So we've, we've got with the Intelligence, the Maneuver Center of Excellence, we've done a lot of partnerships, sharing our data, we have that Teams page, that SharePoint, where we have all of our instructional material where we can share with them. And then we also have to reach out to their horses on the ground, right? If there are other horses in your field that have been working with your data, they can help you there too, right? We're we're here with the, with the loggies, right? We, we have that understanding, and maybe some of the other horses there can help them out. So otherwise, we're, we're all about transparency and sharing. All of our classes are out there. They can come grab it whenever they want, and we can share that kind of material as we go through here. And then also we're doing some collaboration. Uh, since we are in the ORSA community, we have the um, the Center for Army Analysis. Uh, what we're doing is we're building some more upper level stuff for that advanced. And we're building some books, right? We're building some PDFs. So use code. R is a, is a statistical language uh, that you can use, right? It, it's actually free within within the Army and it's also free outside of the Army. But we have some programs where you can be able to actually use it, log in, uh, use a web-based server, and you can be able to have access to R and do some more stats type analysis, a little bit deeper, right, than just that simple Excel stuff. So we're building some how-to books and some common things. So we're doing, you know, like, hey, here's how to do some simple regression. Here's how to do this, some examples. So we're trying to build that. And it's going to be available to anybody, right? It's a, it's a kit bag. It's a PDF. The Army's building it. We're going to share it with all the team uh, so we can build that um, data-centric environment. So we're, as we're slowly building a couple of those things, we already have some basic 40-hour uh, courses for them. And we're also building a, a, that kit bag and some other books we're trying to build. Also for Python is another new language we're trying to build on top of. And we're building those so we can share them throughout the Army. And other than that, I think we're just uh, we're open for questions at this point. Yeah. Sir. Doug Wong for Booz Allen. How is the Mission Command Center of Excellence decision driven data con ops shaping your career? Not necessarily shaping, uh, but closely connected. And so from the um, introduction or the development of the white paper 
we immediately went to Mission Command Center of Excellence when General Beagle appointed them as the proponent for data and started shaping it. So they focused theirs on data literacy, we focused ours on more uh, of the use of data or data analytics. How are you doing? Mike Dove for Colsa. Um, for your data, how, how are you ensuring that the data is Best, the best data that you can have. Uh, aviation guy, I know what gets put in log books sometimes, so just, just curious on how y'all are cleansing that data. And that's a great point, right? Everyone always talks about the bad or the dirty data. So that's why we're trying to teach at every level, right? That's why inside of the initial military training, the IMT training, they are getting data literacy, right? When you're talking to a mechanic, you're talking to somebody who's actually inputting the data, right? You don't just run down when you send miles, go one, two, three, four, right? Inside the miles. You were talking about how important that is and how we can deal with that. So we're teaching it at every level, so hopefully when they're entering the data, we can get the best. And there's, uh, I know we, we did a lot of analysis analysis through, through Palantir, through Army Vantage, right? So it's a big data aggregator where it connects all the systems. And the Center for Army Analysis went through that and they figured out which is the best record. So actually they went through like line by line as they built that Vantage. And there's a couple horses that sat up there and decided, you know, where gender is in 19 different tables, which one is the one, right? So we be built inside that and then we're also trying to enforce and encourage correct data entry at the lowest level. But part of their analysis and what we're teaching them is also data cleaning, right? You're going to get dirty data. What do you do with that? How do you improve it, right? How do you get the things off an email that should have been entered in an Excel spreadsheet and transfer it and be able to actually do some analysis with it? So we're teaching them at that level to be able to clean the data as well and then uh, find those outliers or those bad data. So we're teaching them. Hey, sir. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to put my green seer hat on. I'm a support out Ms. Poe also, sure. So I've got commodity managers that I think would absolutely use some of these courses. So um, where do you see, I, I, you know, after a captain's career course, currently got him enrolled in support operations course. Do you see some of these courses and some of these joint efforts being implemented after, uh, I guess, support operations courses? And do you see a disparity between Compo 1, Compo 2, and Compo 3 implementation for some of these courses? I wouldn't say there's a disparity, it's just being able to get them there, right? I mean, that's one of the things, is trying to be able to use that time, right? That they're, they, they come, come on active duty to be able to get the training. Um, now, we're able to build, we have a data analysis and visualization course. It's actually an 80-hour course outside of any of the other PME where it's specifically for this. And we have all ranks and sizes coming through there from civilians, you know, enlisted warrants and officers coming through, which is that extra. It's kind of like a, it's not quite to the level two like you want it to, but we're building it. And that anyone can come in there, including all compos. So we have a lot of a lot of compo two and three that come inside that course, and they use that 80 hours to be able to take it back to their field inside the ESCs and TSCs. Yeah, hey, and if we oh sorry, just real quick, I was going to say we recently revamped the SPO course as well, or the SOC course, right? The support operations course to include data. We've uh, incorporated in the uh, GCSS Army course and. To the DAV point that he talked about, the uh, the data analysis visualization course, we went from 80 quotas this year to 862 quotas next year. And so we're really trying to open up the aperture to get more green suitors and Department of Army civilians to attend. Hey, good morning. Thanks for putting this on. Vern Myers from uh, Army Contractor Command Orlando. So I'm more interested in the, the structure from Army level down. You may not be able to answer this question, but as far as having uh, chief data officers down at the you know brigade, uh, division level, is there any effort from the Army to kind of look at the structure from top down? It sounds like this is bottom up. Over. It is. So as an ORSA, and I was actually a division ORSA, so it was at the division level, there's two um, ORSA slots or two data decision science, data analysis guys that are there inside the G5 and the or inside the, the plans and the ops, right? So there's actually two that are there. Uh, currently our proponent, uh, Lieutenant General Gingrich is working on maybe making it three, but down all the way to the brigade level is just too much, right? So like they're up there to help uh, at the higher level. Uh, we reached out to the brigades, we did all sorts of stuff uh, from my just um, anecdotal, right? We did all sorts of stuff with uh, the schools to be able to implement their air assault school, because I was at Fort Campbell, 101st, right? Or to do all the analysis for the COVID, right? To do all those kind of things. They're used there inside, and the lowest we go is usually about a two-star level, is where ORSAs are already there. So we're able to help and guide uh, those young guys there. So thank you for that. And that's exactly what I'm concern, concerned about, right? Because if we really want to be a data-centric army, the brigade level, that's probably where we need those experts at. So just something to think about. 
How you doing? Good morning, or good afternoon, actually. Ron Isom from SAP. Uh, how are you integrating simulations into these courses? And the other thing, sort of following on from the gentleman behind me, uh, I see the courses are oriented from lieutenant to major level, it looks like. Uh, what are you doing for the battalion and brigade commanders to understand how they should actually utilize this data? We talk about data-driven decision-making. They're the ones making the decision, but it seems like we don't have any sort of education for them unless you're integrating this into the command courses. I'll just take the last part. So we have integrated it into the sustainment pre-command course. So there's four hours of, you know, it's a five-day course and there's four hours of data. But we've also added it in addition uh, to the standalone four hours, we've also added it into the G Army portion of their SPCC. And then I'll let him take the first part. Simula okay, simulations. I don't think we get into simulations much. We show them a little bit of it in the, in the captain, the 40 hour course. We really do that as horses, because that's talking about big data and really analysis, you know, doing a thousand runs. You gotta know some code, you gotta be able to do that kind of stuff. And eventually, maybe as some of the um, technology and with Microsoft, with the Power BI, with all these things start to grow, we might have an easier capability of doing it. But this, I think that level of understanding is really meant where it comes back to us, right? Where it comes back to those data experts. There, I don't think simulations are, might be useful at that brigade level. Um, maybe, I don't know, right? I haven't been there in a while. But you know, be able to understand where, where we're actually gonna use that data, I think is at those higher levels. But I'm tracking, but we do it inside the ORSA community all the time. We do know at the tactical level, accurate forecasting is critical, right? And so uh, I, I heard a speaker yesterday talk about 33% of all fuel taken in NTC is returned. We gotta get better at that, and this is part of that, uh, that clean data that we talked about. Hello. Uh, for tools, you uh, mentioned Excel, right? So, lifelong user of Excel, love it. Um, are you doing anything to help facilitate APIs? Uh, you mentioned Vantage, or is it I mean, exclusively Excel macros because that's all your users have access to? Or can you use best of breed applications like Salesforce? So actually, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so with Power BI, actually, a big package is, uh, is, is part of it, inside of it, is, is actually a lot of APIs connecting directly to the, to the systems of record. So inside Army 365 now, they're actually building some of these things with a new update where they're actually being able to get those APIs, which is a connection into a data system, for those who understand that, right? To be able to reach in and grab that. So that's actually coming with it, where it's an Army-centric, and you can log in with your CAT card right through Arm, uh, the A365 to be able to access GCSS Army and some of the other, IPSA is another one that they're actually connecting right into to be able to drive through that. Um, we are doing some things on the outside, that's where we come in, right, with R and Python. We do APIs outside of that, but they're actually inside SSI, right, inside the AG school, the Agent General school, that comes, right, with, it's a, it comes with uh, Power BI built in, reading from it right away. So they're able to grab those kind of things instantly without having to build an API. It's already pre-set up uh, with, a, with a larger army contract. Well, we appreciate your time. If you guys want to come up and ask some questions, we'll be stick around for a few more minutes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
other tables in there,
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next panel will start at 12.30. Persistent Experimentation by the Futures and Concepts Center. Lieutenant General David Honey, Brigadier General Stephanie Ahern, and Colonel Scott Sintel. Stand by, please. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Warriors' Corner, we'll start in four minutes. Please gather around and take a seat.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We'll get started with Persistent Experimentation, uh, Futures and Concepts Center, Lieutenant General Hodney, and Brigadier General Ahern will present. Can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you for everyone for joining us at the uh, Warrior Corner on Persistent Experimentation. My name is Dave Hodney. I'm the director of the Future and Concept Center. If you do have cards and letters to send to me, please send them to Fort Eustis, Virginia, and not to Austin, Texas. My predecessor was in Austin. I've now relocated uh, the director position to Fort Eustis. And uh, I've been in position for about two and a half months. I assumed responsibilities in January. And uh, while I may be the new director of the Futures and Concept Center, I'm not new to Army Futures Command. Uh, years ago, I was the director of the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team. I did that job for three years, so I, I love hearing folks talk about things like next-gen squad weapons, CNVGB, IVAS, all those uh, important capabilities for our soldiers. So uh, anyway, I bring that experience with me. I'm proud to be back in Army Futures Command. I'm certainly proud to be part of the Army, Army Modernization Enterprise, because I can think of no more meaningful work for both today's soldiers and tomorrow's soldiers to make sure we get uh, modernization right. Before we begin, uh, we have a video teed up, so if we can show that please, this is a reference project convergence capstone four. lessons and then we take lessons learned and, and apply It's been monumental. All right, so I'm joined by uh, General Steph Ahern. She's the Director of Concepts at the Features and Concepts Center. And you may wonder, why is someone who's the Director of Concepts here for a panel on experimentation? Well, it's, it's precisely the experimentation that went into the future Army Warfighting concept that Steph's gonna discuss uh, later. So, um, Project Convergence Capstone certainly got a lot of uh, top billing in General Rainey's keynote address this morning. And I do want to highlight that Project Convergence Capstone is not the only major experiment executed or hosted by Army Futures Command. And that's what we're going we're to talk about experimentation. While it might be the biggest experiment we do in the dirt, there's a whole host of other experiments that uh, perform equally important functions. Can we pull up the first slide, or the only slide, please? So first, all of our experimentation starts with a warfighting concept. That concept is informed by the future operating environment. Why do we experiment? One, we experiment to inform decisions made by senior leaders. 
In some cases, we experiment to accelerate development of critical capabilities. You heard General Rainey talk about all the lessons we learned with uh, the semi-autonomous semi and robotic systems that we ex experimented with at Project Convergence Capstone. We also experiment to validate and refine our concepts. And lastly, we experiment to inform joint warfighting concepts. Uh, we have good, strong partnerships with the Joint Staff J7. Dag Anderson and I talk routinely on our warfighting concepts. I also have good partnerships with our service futures chiefs to make sure we're, we're aligned uh, in the joint space. We also embed experimental objectives on top of operational exercises that occur inside our combatant commands. Things like Valiant Shield, Balakatan, Northern Edge, those are great opportunities for us to leverage COCOM resourced uh, exercises where we can hit at experimental objectives that not only benefit the U.S. Army, but also benefit our allies and partners that are, that are part of those exercises. I do want to make, while I, while I talk about exercises, I do want to make a distinction that there's a difference between an exercise and an experiment. An exercise is focused on building readiness first. It also addresses specific training audiences, sometimes across multiple echelons. There's clear training objectives. And sometimes what comes out of exercises are observations that may not be backed by a lot of data. Ex experiments are the opposite in some cases. In experiments, we're doing this to, to not build readiness, but to inform future decisions. Instead of training demands, there's learning objectives and learning demands. Sometimes what, we, what doesn't work is as important as what works, and you only learn that through experimentation. And then lastly, it's about data that comes out of the experiment that informs the rigor that we can bring to senior leaders and decision makers so that they know that they're making, uh, making you know, informed decisions. So in this chart, it shows our path to persistent experimentation. You'll see three lines, the black, gray, and gold, black being the future studies program. That's the one Steph's going to talk about in a few minutes. That used to be known as Unified Challenge and Unified Quest. That's where we experiment with our future warfighting concept. And that's a, that's a really important, uh, important endeavor. In the upcoming fiscal year, you'll see future studies programs, FSPs, and you'll see FCXs. In the, in the next fiscal year, uh, 25, we're going to incorporate what we call future combat experiments, which are simulation events that are tied to our warfighting concepts. That, that allows us to get far more sets and reps that we might get in war game. It also allows us to examine specific aspects of the concept that we might want to might want to examine in, fur, in uh, further detail. I do want to note our capability development integration directorates. Uh, each of them participates in our future studies program, so we get that warfighting uh, function expertise that's brought to the warfighting concept. On on, when I speak about CDIDs, you'll see the gold line at the bottom are seeded, supported by our battle labs, execute their own experiments. And I want to highlight these specifically for our industry partners because in spite of the top billing that Project Convergence Capstone uh, 4 got during a, the keynote address and during the subsequent panel, this is a great entry point for industry at our seeded, level, seeded hosted experimentation events. So you'll see them listed on the bottom. MIFIX, or our uh, uh, fires experiment, is hosted by the fire seated. It's hosted at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That, that experiment began 10 years ago in 2014, and they look at tough problems. The most recent experiment examined counter UAS, you know, how we detect, identify, and defeat threat unmanned aerial systems. AWE, or the Army Expeditionary War Warrior Experiment, this is our oldest seated hosted experiment. This one began in 2004. It's hosted by at, at Fort Moore. At uh, AWE, they look at brigade and below simulation. They also look at, uh, most recently, all of the robotics and human-machine uh, in integrated formation work that we showcased at Project Convergence Capstone 4 was, was demonstrated at uh, this most recent AWE. The Sustainment Modernization Experiment, or SMEX, that's the newest uh, experiment we do. It's hosted by the Sustainment Seated at Fort Greg Adams. This one began in 2023. This is an offshoot from the Maneuver Support Protection uh, Integrated Experiment, or MISPIX. And at the uh, Sustainment Modernization Experiment, that last year they looked at uh, joint logistics over the shore, the J-LOTs at Fort Story. And then in the upcoming experiment, they're going to look at uh, telemaintenance, and they're also going to look at uh, 
uh, UAS delivered resupply, which we, we, we experimented with that at uh, Project Convergence. MIS picks, I mentioned previously, the maneuver support protection integrated experiment hosted by a maneuver support CDID. That's at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. That began in 2017, and uh, they look at protection efforts. Uh, the last experiment and notably looked at mobile camouflage systems. And lastly, CQ or CyberQuest, hosted by our Cyber CDID at Fort Eisenhower, Georgia. This is about eight year old experiment, began in 2016. This is what we would look at uh, spectrum situational awareness, how we look, how, you know, what we look like in the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as how we obfuscate our own signals to minimize uh, detection. All of these, uh, again, the AFWI events probably get less press than the other ones, but these are really important experiments that inform and feed into each of our other experimentation events. In the middle bar, Project Convergence, and General Rainey was key to mention a point that there's, it's not a singular event. Project Convergence spans a year-long series of activities between joint warfighting assessments and Project Convergence uh, events in Europe, PCE, and Project Convergence events in the Pacific, PCP. I mentioned some of the exercises uh, we tag on to. And PC, uh, again, I'm a plank holder in Army Futures Command with my teammates Ross Kaufman, John Rafferty, Wally Rugen when they were leading CFTs. PC, PC-19, was bottom-up driven. It was born of a problem that fellow CFT directors realized we needed to do better in terms of integration of our sensor to shooter linkages. So it was an Army, Army internal, you know, just a few sensors, just a few shooters, just to see how we can communicate between observers and fire and, and shooters uh, in the Army space. CFT led, AFC supported, General Murray uh, supported that effort, which now, uh, having left AFC and returned, it's unrecognizable in terms of uh, where, where Project Convergence has, has, has come and, and grown into. It's a fully integrated, Army-hosted joint experiment um, tied with OSD's efforts with combined joint all-domain command and control, CJAD, C2. It's also tied to OSD's CDAO guide, the Global Information Dominance Experiment, which is really important uh, towards realizing uh, joint command and control. Uh, Project Convergence did look at uh, four use cases. Use case one, integrated offensive and defensive fires. Use case two was joint, uh, joint forcible entry operations. Use case three was expanded maneuver, and use case four was sustaining the combined force. This experiment occurred over two locations. For phase one was in Camp Pendleton, California, and then we did a joint forceful entry into the National Training Center. We did a core battle handover between 18th Corps to 3rd Corps, and uh, continued experimentation there. I do want to highlight for use case one, uh, which was really CDAO's guide 9.2 experiment, uh, we processed where I talked about what PC-19 did with essentially a few sh sensors and a few shooters. We processed air and missile tracks at machine speed across multiple headquarters, across multiple services, and across multiple countries. We had m m you know, multinational participation in Project Convergence Capstone. We certainly built on all the takeaways from PC-22. For use case three, expanded maneuver, uh, focusing at the National Training Center, human-machine integrated formations were central to our experimentation. And I'll just, I'll just pile on General Rainey's comments. We saw ground forces, you know, augmented by semi-autonomous and robotic systems could execute combined arms maneuver. And we saw increased protection and increased lethality as a result of uh, that employment. These systems also extended our comms networks, whether through tethered UAS systems or aerial tier network expansion, at and &E, you know, loitering UAS systems that, ex that extended our comms ranges. They allowed for sensing and detection uh, well beyond the forward line of troops. And lastly, they even allowed for improved casualty and patient tracking, as well as remote triage. So pretty, pretty impressive uh, experiments. We also experimented with the first generation or the first, you know, I wouldn't even call it an increment because this was a kind of a lab experiment of C2 Next, what General Rainey described as next generation C2. And uh, we got feedback from leaders from the division to platoon level, and it certainly showed the potential for data-centric C2, uh, a unifying C2 system that seamlessly integrated warfighting functions, not boxes talking to boxes, but a single data layer that allowed 
allowed us to uh, maneuver and fire. Lastly, I can't talk about experimentation with talking about the analysis. So simply in Project Convergence Capstone, we had 250, over 250 analysts. They, they came from the Army. They came from our multinational allies and partners. They also came from joint services. TRAC, DAC, ATEC all provided analysis, an, analysts. We also had assessment teams from Joint Modernization Command, our CDIDs, our CFTs, and lastly, I can't fail to mention the seasoned uh, NTC observer controller teams that provided their in-the-dirt observations uh, just informed by, by their experience. All of that provided insights on over 270 learning objectives for Project Convergence Capstone 4. So with that broad overview of our comprehensive and persistent experimentation effort, I'll, uh, I'll turn this over to Steph Ahern to talk about our future studies program and our concept. Thanks so much, sir. Um, and so what I do want to emphasize is the absolute importance of persistent experimentation helping inform Army 2040 efforts and the concept for 2030 to 2040, which is in that concept-driven transformation period. As we talk to our intelligence community colleagues about the changing future operation environment and the threat, and we talk to the scientists about what technology could be changed by then, the changes are dramatic and intensifying. And I would say that would be expected when we think about people that are in college today uh, being the future battalion commanders, battalion sergeant majors by 2040, uh, people that are in elementary school now just coming in the Army. The concepts should be able to help and they can help because as we're looking to the future, it allows us to use existing technologies, so signature modernization efforts with technologies that exist sometimes in the lab or at small scale. And how do we organize differently and then how do we operate differently? And so in addition to that centrality of the commander and having that judgment and having the intuition and having the uh, analytical understanding to make sense of the data, Military science absolutely matters, and so that methodological rigor that has been informing Project Convergence and all of the battle labs and the experiments that General Hani just talked about is something that we have to include within our war games. It is not okay to look at just a bunch of guys and gals sitting around the table when we're talking about the future Army forces. And so we do have less fidelity in the work that we do. Uh, we use the Marine Corps operational war game system uh, that the, uh, McWill put together. So it's less fidelity, but it's helping us understand some absolutely real challenges and opportunities and things that we're going to have to do even when we don't have that physics-based data that current systems provide. And so how we war game has been a central effort in addition to what we war game over the past three and a half years. So the second point I'd like to raise is, is that so as we're developing the, the Army war fighting concept that, uh, that General Rennie mentioned may be coming out this fall, uh, maybe, um, and we're using to assess and develop the future study program, one of the brilliance of Army Futures Command is from a concept perspective where we have many of the Army scientists we have experts in the threat that have a link to the National Ground Intelligence Center. We have teammates in the concepts community across all of the warfighting functions that are linked directly with the CUECGs. And previously, we had worked directly with West Point's Lieber Institute on the law of armed conflict. Now, in addition to them, we work with AFC's staff judge advocate. And so that role of law of armed conflict that General Rainey really emphasized they are absolutely a part of our war games experimentation as well. So working across with all of the Army commands, we've had the opportunity to have core G5s in with us, uh, people coming from both of the priority theaters and from the, our north. In addition, the chief of engineers, so General Rainey highlighting the importance of the engineers coming up as one. Um, the Engineer Research Development Command also has a large group of scientists and they've been with us from the very beginning. And then our joint partners. Our allies, uh, the Five Eye allies, um, our work is the input for the Army to the Joint Warfighting Command. I'm sorry, the Joint Warfighting Concept. And so as we're learning things within our research, as we're able to learn from other services and the JWC, it gets tested, we are pushing and pulling those ideas across. Um, in addition, as far as for how we war game, had tremendous support from RAND, from IDA, the other services to make sure that the methodology that we're using in the systems exploration war game is sound. 
Um, so the last thing as far as just kind of what we're seeing, and, and the nice part of being able to support General Honey, support General Rainey, the ideas that General Rainey talked about, the challenges within the concept-driven transformation, are what we've been able to derive over the past three and a half years, working very closely with our joint and 5i allies. Um, we are seeing, again, the criticality of that data and the resiliency to systems, the all domain sensing, the offensive and defensive fires, protection, 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 and the ability from a sustainment to be able to, to operate over these extended distances. Um, and then again, that power and energy that, that he highlighted, um, really critical aspects of what we're seeing. And so I think the last thing I just want to, to leave with is, is that as we're approaching this work, one of the things that I'm most um, appreciative of is that we're now working with the, the other services very closely and we're all seeing the problem very similarly. And so the opportunity to work with each other to solve these problems, to work with other parts of academia, to work with industry partners going forward, this is absolutely essential because these challenges are real, but the opportunity to make a difference is also real as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That uh, concludes our presentation. I think we'll turn it over to see if there's any questions from the audience. Sir, ma'am, uh, Colonel Retired Brian Cook, MKS2 Technologies. I'm going to ask the same question I asked over of General Rainey. Where does, where does quantum, quantum computing, maybe even quantum power fit into the future combat studies? Good to see you, Brian. Uh, so I would say, again, being a scientist, but getting the opportunity to work with them. This is one of the areas from Army, from DOD, that absolutely is a priority research area. Um, and so having quantum experts within uh, DEVCOM, working with Erdic, uh, within Erdic is something that we are leveraging heavily. Um, this is something that there are places that we see having an impact by 2040. There are obviously things that aren't going to be ready by 2040. Um, so what we're trying to do is to make sure that as we're developing the concept that we're not trying to rely on fantasy. And that where the, the science is is where we're trying to be able to operate with. And Brian, I'm going to fulfill the task that General Rainey levied on me in the, this morning's session. The Future Studies program is in, also intended where I talked about AFWIS as an entry point for industry. FSP is also a point where industry can help us if they have bring in expertise on some areas that uh, we, may, we may not have the full depth of expertise. We certainly can find opportunities there. Thanks, Brian. Um, quick question for how are you implementing artificial intelligence into your space? Yeah, I think that, I think we're seeing that. I think if you ask the, the industry partners of Project Convergence Capstone, they would tell you a lot of the systems that were in the dirt included AI, ML opportunities in there. So it's, it, it, it's and General Rainey talked about data-centric C2. That's certainly an essential component of it. Uh, hi, Dave Lockhart uh, with the Boeing Company. Uh, the, the question I'm uh, thinking about and trying to think through is, is participate in a series of experiments. Industry will bring some system to be looked at. And now that you've got the three different pathways, uh, it could be in, in any one of two. But prior to getting to that point, we usually find ourselves in other experiments that may be done by some of the CFTs and things like that. One, how do these things kind of group together such that the work you do in one uh, counts toward some understanding of the other and at the end of the exercise, what happens next? Because, you know, that's the question we routinely get from senior leaders. After you're done with the exercise, what is the Army going to do? What's the linkage to the material acquisition side of the house. What, what, what do they do with this information? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. One, we threw this slide up to 
educate on the experimentation. There's a difference between, as a former CFT director, a soldier touch point is not an experiment. A user jury, a user study is not an experiment. Those are tied to requirements the CFT may be pursuing. And then they're going to learn something about how they, in General Rainey talked about capability needs statement. Tony Potts and I, you know, did tiered capability matrix, you know, the threshold and objective without a specific, it's like industry, tell us what's in the range of, range of the possible. This is to show you that there's, one, there's a tiering. Uh, FSP, project convergence gets top billing, but FSP, the concept, again, I go back to everything starts with the concept. Project convergence is informed by our concept. We're not just doing things randomly. It's informed by the direction that the Army leaders want to take us. And you hit it on the topic that uh, both Honorable Bush and General Rainey talked about transparency. Uh, uh, Mr. Trudeau also mentioned it in the panel this morning about what industry wants and transparency. So there are outcomes that come out of each of these. Uh, project Convergence Capstone, um, General Rainey offered some high-level, you know, initial senior leader insights that he had from his personal experience. The 250 analysts that are crashing right now on the sorting through the data will probably take a few months before we have the detailed insights that come out of Project Convergence Capstone. So the feedback that comes to everyone that participated in that will follow once the analysts have had a chance to review that. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you're at your question about the changes. Yeah, yeah you, that's that's what uh, General Rainey and Honorable Bush talked about today. You know, leveraging congressional authorities, flexible, agile funding. Uh, you know, the Ch Army senior leadership de desire to do a portfolio view. All those things you know, come out of this process. The CFT directors and I communicate routinely, the CDIDs and I routinely communicate routinely, the COE commanders and I routine, uh, communicate routinely. So we're all tied in, uh, tied in together. Thanks for that. Sir, ma'am, okay, that works. Um, sir, ma'am, thank you. A uh, question about um, learnings from project convergence and uh, specifically as it relates to human machine integrated formations. Um, I was a striker at PL back in the day at NTC and I had very undermanned platoon, probably 26 guys and I had to leave 12 back with my four strikers. Um, I can't imagine then you know, hitting objective with 12, 14 guys that have to give up a couple of them or to, to then man a robot or control a robot instead of you know, clearing the rooms. Um, I was wondering if, if that came up at all in, in kind of how, in the concept of and how we're kind of getting after it, just how the squads operate. Yeah, the, the one, General Rainey, robots don't replace humans. I'm sorry you're manning challenges in your formation at the NTC, um, but no, they did not replace humans. They certainly provided, you know, trade, you know, uh, steel for first contacts. We're not, we're not losing human lives where we don't need to. Um, we had soldiers controlling semi-autonomous systems that did not come in a decrement to the formation's ability to execute their assigned tasks. General, great to see you again, and thanks to both of you for uh, addressing the crowd here in the noisy space. I know that's not easy. A, a question also with uh, human-machine integration. You mentioned the forthcoming update to the Army operating concept. Will that address the underpinnings for HMI, or do you see that as a separate effort of the board? So it, it is a foundational aspect of efforts by 2040 and in part because it's going to take practice and if we're going to offload risk and there'll be some offloading work we have to have over time the ability to gain confidence in the technology that we're working there will obviously be a different and different type of formations there are some things that machines are, are very good at there are things that humans will never rely on machines to do uh, but this is something that we see is also there are things we must be able to do today but the human-machine integration is, is a very important part of the 2040 work as well. Hey, Jeff. Hey. Hello. Hey. Jeff Lankin. 
Are we playing? Are we playing? Do not give a microphone to a man over 60, apparently. Hey, uh, so the question is, are we planning any really good experiment, experiments where we're expecting the network, but really we know the network's not going to work because physics is still physics. Are we planning any, any experiments with intentionally not having the network work or barely work? That, that's, that remains an essential component. You know, denied, degraded, you know, intermittent, latent, those are part of our experimental conditions. Comms was central to everything we did at Camp Pendleton. NetBot X in the fall will further look at those kinds of things, so yes. Um, and I've seen some capabilities on the floor here that acknowledge the GPS denied, GPS jammed conditions, you know, separate from operator user error potentially. Um, there, there's certainly a lot of uh, you know, compelling capabilities out here just on the floor here that address exactly that. Thank you. Sir Doug Morrison, I appreciate both of your comments. I direct my question, I think, to you, sir. If you're willing to go out a little bit in some deep water, given what you've seen so far, going back to when you were at what was then Fort Benning, now Fort McMurray, and what you see going forward, and what you see on the threat side that many of us don't see, are you confident that the direction, the azimuth that you're headed in, and the potential capabilities are, are, are we going to are you going to see the delivery are we going to see the delivery of those capabilities that we need and is it going to be in a timely enough fashion I know that's probably going far out for you but just trying to get a feel for what else is occurring yeah appreciate no, that no happy to happy to discuss that so and Doug I think you know I'll echo some of my points I made at AWE at Fort Moore so lethality is defined when you were a lieutenant when I was a lieutenant, or, I'm sorry, um, overmatch, was defined as a function of lethality and protection. Our lethality and our protection had to exceed the lethality and protection of our adversaries. Pretty simple formula. You know, we, we used to own the night because our lethality, we can shoot, acquire and shoot and kill in the dark, and we can move undetected with our night vision advantage. So lethality was, or uh, overmatch was a function of lethality and protection. We no longer own the night, we share it. We operate in a you know, highly ubiquitous sensors. You, you, you'll, you'll be seen in today's and tomorrow's battlefield. So how we define overmatch and the capabilities we pursue, or, or pursue to do that, overmatch is no longer a function of just lethality and protection. It's a function of lethality and protection, but it's also a function of situational awareness and mobility. It's also a function of decision advantage, things that General Rainey talked about today. So the capabilities we're pursuing that allow us to, like IVAS, situational awareness and mobility, I can move without looking at a map quickly. I can, you know, I put IVAS on my face, one of the earlier versions, 1.2 is moving into great, spa uh, great space. Linked up with a moving platoon at Fort Pickett in the dark over 1,100 meters. I never put that device on my face before. I mean, I'm sorry, I never walked at Fort Pickett before. I, I put, I, I used, I, used IVAS before but I was able to link up with a moving platoon in the dark and you know, go straight to the platoon leader and talk to him about that. Those are the kind of capabilities. Now, IVAS still has some, some, some work, to, work to go, but those capabilities we're pursuing, General George's intent to pursue C2 next, to give commanders situational awareness, you know, data layers that connect division to platoon so everyone can see, you know, have common understanding of the fight. Um, I think we are heading in the right direction. It's hard. It's a hard slog. Everyone that's in the melee of modernization recognizes it's a hard, tough slog to deliver capabilities that our soldiers need. But I'll go back to my opening comment. It's meaningful work, uh, and I'm certainly happy to be invested in that. I'm getting the I'm getting the hook. I think I went a few minutes over. Sorry about that. But uh, appreciate uh, everyone's time. Steph, thanks for joining me on this panel. Appreciate you listening to our panel for system experimentation.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next panel, Jungle Arctic IBCT Focus CTC Training Exercises and Scenarios. Presented by TRADOC, Mr. Martin Hoffman and Colonel Brian Martin. Start time, 1.15. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next topic, Jungle, Arctic IBCT focused CTC training and exercises, presented by Mr. Hoffman and Colonel Martin and all of their props up front. Please join us in a round of applause. Thank you. We're going to start with a short video, and then Lieutenant General Gervais, the Deputy Commander for Trade-Off, will do a short intro. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Hey, so I'm um, Lieutenant General Maria Gervais. I'm the training and doctor command, uh, deputy commanding general. But I also had the opportunity to be the deputy commanding general at Combined Arms Center Training, where we oversee the collective level training for the United States Army. And the reason that this warrior corner um, is taking place right now is because we have to understand how to replicate the operational environment that the, our soldiers are going to operate in. And that doesn't matter, you know, whether that's in a desert or that's in the Arctic. And we have to understand it from the perspective of what is the equipment that we need, how do we replicate the op, uh, the op for, the opposing force, and present that picture to them in a scenario so that they can train. And that's what the team is going to talk to you about, our TRADOC G2 team and our partners at USERPAC, because I think this is an area where we really have to understand the requirement, the scenarios, and how we train. And so, Mario, I'm going to turn it over to you. And don't don't be easy on them. Ask them the tough questions, right? Thank you, ma'am. So, good afternoon. My name is uh, Mario Hoffman. I am the uh, director of the U.S. Army Opposing Forces Program, and I represent uh, Trade of G2, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence. Uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alvarez. I'm the DCO for JPMRC, 
in the Pacific. Hello everybody, uh, I'm First Sergeant Constantino. I'm here representing the 11th Airborne Division up in Alaska. Hello, I'm uh, Captain Kyle Bucherud. I'm a company commander down in uh, 2nd Brigade, uh, 127 Infantry. Uh, last but not least, uh, Captain Briggs, I'm an OE Op 4 scenario planner for JPMRC. Thank you. So times have changed. <clears throat> 40 years we spent in the uh, post-World War II aftermath of the Cold War, looking at the Soviet Union and Russia. Then we spent the next two decades in the Middle East. During the entire time, we were also looking at North Korea. Who would have thought 60 years ago that our pacing threat, according to our National Defense Authorization Act, is going to be China? China is our pacing threat, with a new emphasis on the Indo-Pacific. So for this afternoon, we're going to spend a few minutes to introduce you to challenges in training in the jungle environment and in the Arctic environment and some of the capability shortfalls that we have that hopefully maybe industry may have some solutions for. We'll do this in three parts. First, Colonel Alvarez will talk to you about the exercise design scenario, multinational partnership. Then I will talk about a little bit about the threat conditions and how we keep things unclassified. And then we'll close it with discussions and hopefully get our first sergeant and company commander to share some of the experiences and answer questions. Colonel Alvarez? Thank you, sir. So, what is JPMRC? So many people understand what is JPMRC, but it's another CTC. So, I'm going to give you a little bit of background what JPMRC is. In 2018, General Flynn, the commander of the Pacific, understand we have a gap. He went back to the Army, and he said we need to have a CTC. It takes us 30 to 60 days to ship 25th ID back to the U.S. to other CTCs plus another 30 days training. So total of 90 days, if you put that, return of the equipment, so it's another 30 days. So now readiness is going down. You take that brigade commander, that division commander, the assets that he have available in the theater to actually fight and train. So he decide, I'm going to create JPMRC. So JPMRC is the newest CTC that we have in the, in the Pacific. It support indo pacom mission, is actually provide readiness to the 25th ID in Hawaii and the partners. This last rotation, we execute rotation with total of 18 observers from multinational partners, and we have five different units that support the exercise. We have Philippines, we have Korean, we have Thailand, you can mention, we have Canada, and it continues to grow as a partner relationship support this mission. We also have an Arctic operation, 11 Airborne Division. We support that mission with the joint partners in the Arctic condition high altitude. When you're talking about high altitude cold weather conditions, we're talking about negative 60, negative 54, which you cannot train. But we got a different challenge. We got a challenge with equipment. We got a challenge with batteries. We got a challenge to support the soldiers. We got a challenge with the partners. They have not equipment in order to operate in this environment. And we have another rotation that it happened west to the IDL. Last year, we executed Tassel Saber with the Australians. We're talking about 40 joint units and multinational partners working in one environment in support of the theater operation. This next year, we go to the Philippines and we're going to introduce over there how is a CTC run, and we go assist our Philippine partners to ensure they understand how to train. So that's what JPMRC came up. It's the newest CTC in the Pacific, and that's what we have right now. So when we're talking about JPMRC, we're talking about regional combat training center that is validating the organization's readiness and training. So we create an environment that is real. Before going to the U.S., going to the different CTCs, it was a great training. In 1978, we came up with NTC. Then we came up with JRTC. But the environment is not what we fight. We need an environment where we can involve partnership, an environment where we can fight 
we can train as we fight for the division commanders. As a GRTC, we don't want the high court. The division commander is in charge of the high court. We enable the entire exercise, but we allow the division commander to trigger, make decisions, and provide that resources to the, to the brigade commander. JP Mercy uh, primarily generates readiness by operating in the pathways. The pathway is the line that we have in order to operate in the theater. In Hawaii, in my years experience in the Army, it's only one place I see so many join. I've been in Europe, I've been in many other locations. But when you're talking about joint assets, and you go into the Pacific, you have the Navy, you have the Marines, you have the Air Force. We depend on the Coast Guard as we cross in between islands. We have the multinational partners also. So that's what you gotta think about. Where all the location you can involve so many joint partners in one exercise that the Pacific. That is an innovation and it's also coming with a set of challenges that we have in previous exercise. We have challenge with interoperability. We have challenge with communications between our joint assets. How we communicate, how we fight. We have a logistician problem as we move 3,000 miles from the main islands of Hawaii to Guam, to different locations, Philippines. So it's a, it's a big problem set that we have over there. And General Flynn, Colonel Brian Martin have been assigned to define how we better understand this problem set. So when we're talking about I already talk about partners. We talk about how many partners we have over here. In my years of experience in the other CTCs, we don't have, we probably have one or two partners, but when we're talking about partners, it's the opportunity to link with different partners, understand interoperability. When we're talking about systematic, we're talking about communications, we're talking about different systems, C2 that we have, but something that we identify in previous exercises is also equipment. Well, we believe that the equipment is integrated together and it's the same because it looks similar, it may not be. So allow us to explore, experience, and experiment with different opportunities that we have. The IS system, when we're talking about virtual, we have virtual and we have constructed. JPMRC and the virtual system, we use the IS systems, which one? It's exportable. It's the only CTC that can export from Hawaii all the way to the Philippines, provide mile systems to track unit players, to track everybody in the, in the field as they operate, and to provide the, that battalion, brigade, and division commander with the inputs of how the force is being operated. So just think about that. It's towers and systems that got it, provide that. And we experimented with so many issues we have, communications, 5G networks, when we're talking about Alaska, some of the challenge we have is batteries problems with equipment. We're talking about U.S. working for 30 minutes, one hour. When you deploy a negative 30, that can be constrained to 10, 15 minutes. So as many constraints we have over here as we develop the environment. But I'll go pass it to Mr. Hoffman and we go talk a little bit. Go to the next slide. So this is two of the rotations we have over here. We have one in the Arctic and one in Hawaii. We talk about this briefly, but you can see how different in the terrain expansion that we have for logistation products that we have set and the impact that we have. For NDO, it's a, it's a great place for NDO as we have fires, communication systems, and space. It's, it's just a, a good problem set that we have to open. I'm going to give it to uh, Mr. Hoffman that we can talk about the OE environment. Stay on the slide here for a second. Um, you know, the resiliency of the soldiers that belong to the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center is incredible. So when they finish their rotation at the end of each year in Hawaii, doing the jungle, they celebrate Christmas, and then they go from 80 degree weather, 80 degree weather in Hawaii, 
Within 24 hours, they're in Alaska doing sub-40. 120 degree weather, and they immediately get down to training. And what's unique about both of these rotations is we cannot replicate this anywhere else. So when we're talking about the Pacific, often we talk about the first and second island uh, chains. Hopefully most of you understand what that means. Nickname island hopping. That's part of the Chinese vision for, for the fence. That is what JPMRC is doing in Hawaii, island hopping, where all of a sudden your division and your core is not what's around you. It's the Navy. It's the Air Force, it's the Marines, it's true, joined. In Alaska, a little bit like NTC, you can see for miles and miles, maybe even further in clear, brisk, nice, sunny day weather, but your movement to get anywhere, hours, days, very slow. And you certainly don't want to move fast, because you start sweating on the old gear that first time is showing up here, and then you start freezing from the inside out. So it's definitely a completely different environment to consider. Next slide. But so is the threat. So to keep things unclassified, we in TRADOC have developed what's called the decisive action training environment. The decisive training action environment is, is based on four regions. One is the Pacific slash Indo-Pacific. The original one is the Caucasus. There's one for Europe and there's one for Africa. Each one of these has multiple countries in it that are based on real countries and based on real-world operational environment assessments and threat for their region. However, we do adjust it to keep things unclassified. When we train in date type of scenarios, we're not training to fight the Chinese, but we want to be ready to fight the tactics and the capabilities and the environmental factors. Environmental factors include the political, the military, economic, social, infrastructure, information, time and the physical terrain, terrain we kind of talked about. So what you see here on the left is the Indo-Pacific version of, of DATE. To your far left corner was the original version that was pretty much focused on the Philippines, and then we've expanded it to the mainland. There's multiple vignettes within the decisive action training environment that you can use. So the DATE is not a scenario itself. JPMRC or units develop their own scenarios based on their exercise requirements, training objectives. Highlighted in red are countries that are not favorable to the US, therefore typically the bad guy, but you don't have to turn them into the bad guy. Amber being neutral slash fear, and green obviously being friendly. To your right side you see the multiple organizations that are currently transitioning to use DATE Indo-Pacific. So the Army is making a deliberate shift TRADOC is making a deliberate shift from teaching Russian slash former Soviet threat capabilities, tactics, equipment to focus now on China. As the chief has said, he wants us, the U.S. Army, to understand the Chinese threat, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, to understand that as well as we once knew the Krasnovians. In this case, we call them the Olvanas. Again, Olvana is notional, but it's based on real world intelligence and real-world information. So it's not make-believe, it's just the country that's make-believe. Next slide. So to give you a little cross-reference, to your top left you actually see the People's Liberation Army, which has a total of five theater commands comprised of 16 armies. Each army has approximately six brigade combat teams, combined arms brigades, and six enabling brigades. Generally, they do not have divisions. And I'll talk about what the brigades look like and why they don't have divisions. But needless to say, they followed up example during the uh, coin war where our center of gravity, our primary unit of, of uh, maneuver was the brigades. They are heavy on uh, ground-based air defense. That's how they get their air parity and their anti-access area denial. Reconnaissance, much emphasis on UAVs, but actually any technical advantage that they can gain. So they are more reliant on technology than they are on human reconnaissance teams. And last but not least, they're reinforced by Army group capabilities. Again, as I mentioned, no divisions. Therefore, the enablers that they get, either they have them already within the Army, or they get them even from higher, pushed all the way down to the brigade. So frequently when I hear a brigade combat team training, and we create an opposing force to train against, 
What I see at times is commanders wishing things away. Well, that wouldn't be in a brigade. Absolutely, it would. It comes from Army all the way down to a brigade. And you will see cyber and advanced electronic warfare. In fact, the Chinese CTC version of their OP4 is more capable than ours. So in the bottom right, you will see our version of Olvana. In this case, we use three theater commands, again, six maneuver brigades, combined arms brigades with some enabling, but much more flexible in order for us to change our force structure as well as order battle to meet training objectives. And this is why I mean that we're not replicating China or the PLA, we're replicating the capabilities and the tactics so we're ready for any type of event. Next slide. So the combined arms brigades are broken up into three variations, a heavy, armor, medium, mechanized, light, motorized, if you will, or light infantry. Each one of those brigades actually looks very familiar like ours, probably copied. The difference is they're bigger, they're balanced. So instead of having, for example, one armor battalion and two mech battalions, they will have two armor battalions and two mech battalions. Everything about those brigades is bigger, with one purpose, to defeat our brigade in a head-on-head, -head, win the first fight. That's the focus. We take these real-world PLA type of brigades and we transition it to what does this mean to achieve the training objectives of units. How do we enable them? What do we need to bring into the opposing forces program? And then we actually build it out at our combat training centers. And we cannot build everything. So we try to choose the most likely system or capability that we may see fighting in the Indo-Pacific. Next slide. So here's where we start running into our challenges. So Hawaii, restrictions on armor movement. It's a beautiful island, we don't want to tear it up like we did NTC, right? In Alaska, especially during the Arctic conditions, during whiteout, you will not see the little cliffs and the ravines and other things. Therefore, your movement is really restricted for safety. The point being is, it doesn't make much sense to bring armor into Alaska, and we're not allowed to do it in Hawaii. So how do we replicate armor-type threats? Why replicate armor threats? We know for a fact that if we do have to face a PLA type of fight, whether it's an island hopping or in a mainland, we will see armor. Their marines are enormously big, very heavily armored, focused, water-based. So we will see that. Not only does our infantry brigade heavily rely on their AT systems, but that is part of the combined arms fight and the joint fight. In other words, enemy armor are high-value targets and we need to train to destroy them. Therefore, we need to be able to replicate them. However, physically replicating them has been a challenge. In part, if you remember when I opened my discussion in 40 years focusing on Russia and the Soviet Union, and then we spent 20 years in the Middle East, so we're kind of behind the power curve being able to be able to technically define, certainly replicate threat systems, capabilities, signatures, and attack surfaces. And we'll talk about that in a minute, especially with, uh, with Captain Riggs. So what you see here in the front is one of the problem sets. We'll talk a little bit more. But probably our biggest challenge is being able to replicate certain armor capabilities with visual modifications on existing platforms. In other words, vehicles that we have in the light infantry unit in both Hawaii and in Alaska, such as the joint tactical vehicle and the uh, family of medium uh, vehicles that most infantry battalions and companies have. If we can create easy, uh, sustainable, low-cost solutions to vidmod those, we've tried it, our units tried it for themselves, we're kind of okay, but it's the multi-signatures, the advanced signatures of ISR and targeting systems that make it not good enough. And this is where I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Captain Riggs, and we'll tag team and talk about some examples of what we're talking about. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so as Mr. Hoffman was mentioning, we're reliant on the family of Humvees and JLTVs to provide our up for vehicle signatures. And you might be wondering, why is that? Well, unfortunately, we do not have a standing op 4 with a whole tire equipment set that is easily replicable of op 4 equipment. So if 2nd Brigade from 25th ID is the rotational training unit, it is up to the sister brigade to provide the op 4 personnel and the exercise support crew personnel. 
What we don't have is that accurate family of vehicles that would replicate a PLA threat. Um, and that's where, as you can kind of see, the actual vehicle types and what we've used to replicate it, it, it doesn't necessarily match. So if you're talking about providing the right kind of signatures, so that's visual signatures, that's auditory signatures, thermal signatures, and the electromagnetic signatures. And really what's that getting at is it's providing at least the right context so that Intel can drive the targeting process and then we can use joint um, enablers, multinational enablers, who want to experiment at a JPMRC to actually destroy these threats that would be organic to a near peer threat in the region. So that's where you know, using industry and kind of looking at different solutions because in Hawaii there was strikers and in Alaska there were strikers. So you're talking about the armor person carrier as part of the PLA uh, task organization. It's just something that we cannot sustain here um, in the Pacific for Hawaii and Alaska. And the same type of difficulties that we have for tracked vehicles. So 113 chassis that you normally see at NTC, well, good luck trying to get those driving in Hawaii with environmental. So that's where we have a lot of the difficulties where it needs to provide all the right signatures so it can actually drive some type of training value. And not just for you know the virtual or constructive, but for the pilot on the pilot in the sky for the EW personnel, from the EW platoons, from the signers to provide the, the right kind of signature um, so they can go, go ahead and collect off of that to drive the actual targeting and try, try to drive multi-domain operations. Um, and on the right side there, you see the multi-signature and attack surfaced. So really, you know, if we have not just for the maneuver forces for your typical infantry fighting vehicles or main battle tanks or armor personnel characters for a threat, but to have those additional systems, those air defense systems that would be organic to a Alvanen threat or the near peer threat in the region. And really, it's to provide the right signature so that there's training value for all the different personnel that are coming in. So like JPMRC is a big J for joint, multinational for the big M. Um, so for radars for ELIN, C2 for SIG and data, and then for visual for GON, so providing that, and then the UAV for UAS support, and then to provide that actual auditory signature so it's not just a tracked vehicle with a bunch of kids on, kits on it operating in the training area with no actual tank signature or track signature with the, the engines, but providing all the right things so that we can get proper training value out of having these equipment sets uh, in the training area replicating the correct threat. So we're down to about five minutes. Of course, any solutions that industry might be able to advise for us or help us with needs to be transferable between Hawaii and Alaska. Alaska being the problem at 40 below, a lot of the rubber seals, cables, they freeze and they crack, so they need to be uh, certainly endured for that. So having said that, I would like to turn it over to the audience for questions, discussions, uh, certainly discussions for actual experience on the ground, which is why we have the first son and the company commander with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just a question about um, Olvana capabilities. Uh, are you seeing anything with autonomy on that front and, the, and their kind of use of robotics um, in the island, island hopping scenarios? And if so, what we're doing about it? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think in the previous discussion where uh, um, AFC talked a little bit about the future, they talked about some autonomous, they talked about experimentation. All of those things we need to challenge through the OP4 program. Now, within the OP4 program, we have not introduced autonomous capabilities yet. Uh, we're certainly looking at that. That is certainly part of the threat. And as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese are definitely very technologically focused. So we will definitely see that. Okay, if there's no questions, I'm actually just going to turn over the mic to the captain and the first sergeant and just let them talk their experiences. There was one question. Yeah, thank you. Um, replication challenge. I have been also at the GMRC in Onfels and they had also this replication challenge for uh, armor, for lack of armor, not for the ter terrain. Um, my experience was it's not only about the signature, but also to replicate the effects. So at the time, okay, it was 10 years ago, where there was no C, okay, you're out. How is it uh, today? So that is actually a great point. I visit uh, JMRC in, in Germany quite frequently. You make a key point about the effects. So often we use the word stimulate, right? The op for stimulates the training unit. 
Stimulate is good enough to make a decision. I am doing something to the training unit that causes the training unit commander to make a decision to react to me. Learning really comes when we see the effects of my decision. In other words, we're looking for the effect. How does the OP4 capability work? How do the tactics counter that? That is key. The challenge in Europe is, is twofold, uh, but less complex than in Hawaii or Alaska. One, they do have armor. They have multinational partners that bring armor from several of the countries, to include uh, Germany, um, and we learn from each other. Their challenge is trying to operate uh, both on blue and on red. For example, when we introduced a OP4 striker vehicle that was Vismonit modified into a BTR, we had a French version of a striker, we had the OP4 version of a striker, and we had the uh, unit that was striker. And all of a sudden, on the first rotation where we introduced all three, we had all kinds of fratricide. So definitely lessons to be learned. So uh, just to highlight some of the challenges that we, we face out in the, the jungle environment. So some of the equipment that I have uh, placed before me, um, got my rucksack packed to the jungle configuration. So kind of fit through the, the tight squeezes that the terrain really uh, dictates for us. And that's what I'd say is our, our primary uh, you know, threat to our, our movement out there and, and how we're able to be detected is uh, how you know, canalizing the terrain is. So. Uh, we use a lot of uh, mountaineering uh, techniques, skills that uh, some of our more experienced people are able to, to pass off to some of our junior soldiers to kind of traverse some of the, the gulches uh, that we're going to find out in the Pacific. Uh, another thing is, is soldier load. So, with, uh, you know, we have found that the, the U.S. Army packing this, the standard what, what you always are, are used to, is, is wearing down that, that soldier life, that soldier battery a lot. Quicker, so, so some of the, even the gear that I'm wearing is is uh, test items, and it's lightened to be able to keep those soldiers dry and keep them light, uh, so we're able to, to maneuver in a tough terrain. So we make the signal over there. The time is over, but we go move to the left over here. If you have any questions, please feel free to actually go come back over here to us and talk to us. Okay. Uh, thank you for your participation. Thank we you do have time. some brochures, some Chinese playing cards with the equipment capabilities, all free for the taking. Thank you.
topic, Medical Logistics and Campaigning, MIC Update by CECOM, Major General Robert Edmondson, Commander of CECOM, and Colonel Mark Weld, Commander of Army Material Logistics Command. We will start in five minutes.
Find a seat, get comfortable. And I'd like to introduce the next panel and its members. The panel, Medical Logistics and Campaigning Update, presented by Major General Edmondson and Colonel Weldy. Please welcome them. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for spending some time with us here at the Warriors Corner so that we can talk about medical logistics. If I would have stood on this stage a few years ago, I could not have told you that we were able to get medical supplies to the point of need uh, on time, synchronized with the operations. I could not have told you that we we're able to sustain and maintain medical capabilities in accordance with O plans on time directed at the point of need. But I'm proud to say that we're able to do that today. We're not finished by any stretch of the imagination. But there is uh, there's a movement that is happening. We are transforming Army Medical Logistics Command. We've been doing that for a number of years now. But before I go any further, I want to go ahead and address the elephant that's in the room, if you don't mind. And some of you might be asking, why is a career communicator standing here talking about Army Medical Logistics? Because I know I've run into a couple of people out there. I want to take just a moment and talk about some of what we have in common across all of C5 ISR. Can we advance one slide? All right, there we go. What we 
have in common across all of C5 ISR. And there are three pieces that we have in common that make this quite logical that we have a really good working relationship, command level relationship today. And number one is that whether it is C5 or ISR or medical, it's all high-end technology. All have that in common, which can mean that we can speak a different language to ourselves. Number two, low density MOSs, low density number of soldiers on the ground that are either signal, intel, or medical. Again, that's the second thing that we have in common. The third piece that we have in common is that the technology that I spoke about in the very beginning, that high-end technology that Army Medical Logistics Command is involved in on a daily basis, will change rapidly. No different than C5 or ISR. The medical is also going to change rapidly. And so given those three elements that we have in common, it makes a great deal of sense for us to all work together. I'm sharing that with you as something that I didn't know coming into the position, but as I began to sit with the professionals inside Army Medical Logistics Command, it became clear that we do have a lot in common. There is a reason that, we have, that we're all working together right now. And the most important point here is, whether it is C5 or ISR or medical, we have the capability to get the equipment to the point of need at the time in which it is actually needed. I've said a couple of different times in other forums that the reason that C5 and ISR maintenance and sustainment has been successful over the years is not because of C5 or ISR, but frankly it's because of the AMC enterprise that is extended throughout the globe. The AMC enterprise that operates on a daily basis from the defense industrial base all the way to the point of need. And they are organized that way on a daily basis 24-7. And we, C5, ISR, and medical, leverage that AMC enterprise to, in this case, get the medical components, the supplies, as well as the, med the uh, sustainment to the point of need, traversing the, med the AMC enterprise. There are a couple of examples that I'd like to give you uh, of areas in which Army Medical Logistics has really made a difference over the last couple of years. One of those areas, if you think back to August two years ago, when some of our Afghan partners were being evacuated from Southwest Asia and brought here to the United States, it was Army Medical Logistics Command in partnership with CECOM and Army Materiel Command that was able to take medical supplies and move them first from CONUS, some in Maryland where we're stationed, all the way to Southwest Asia, point of need. And then when we received the mission that some of our partners, Operation Allied Welcome, would come to the United States, we were then able to take those medical supplies, synchronize them with uh, aircraft, synchronize them with Army Sustainment Command, synchronize them with uh, the plan here in the United States to take care of our partners, and we're able to move those medical supplies, to, again, to the point of need. A, sec a second example that I'd like to give you is our support here in the United States Army to Ukraine, our Ukrainian partners. Uh, we have been a part of some of the presidential directives to ship capacity into Ukraine for our partners. And it's been both hardware and software and medical that we've been able to move around the globe. And again, getting back to the magic of the AMC enterprise in this case here, we're able to move vehicles along one route and we're able to move medical equipment sets along another route to marry up in country, in theater, at the point of need, at the time that was actually needed. So before I turn things over here to the commander of Army Medical Logistics Command, I just kind of want to bring us right back around to the fact that the magic of the AMC enterprise uh, is the reason that Army Medical Logistics Command is able to maneuver capacity and capability around the globe in a way that was not previously able to be done.
And so with that, Mark, I'm going to turn things over to you and we'll enter entertain your questions. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Colonel Mark Weldy. I'm the commander of the Army Medical Logistics Command. As General Edmondson pointed out, uh, in about 2019, we moved from MedCom over to Army Material Command, and that's where we reside now. Uh, so I, before we uh, get going, I'd like to give you a, just a, a quick tease on what our command does across the globe, and then we'll talk specifically about MedLog and campaigning. So AMLC is one of five of the Army's LCMCs, and the only arm, uh, L, uh, LCMC for med medical material. Uh, we provide Class 8 medical material and sustainment level maintenance to enable combat power across the globe. We have three subordinate units and roughly 900 people across 20 locations around the globe. You can see our command structure down there on the bottom right. Uh, two of our organizations, the United States Army Medical Material Center, Korea and Europe, they are designated by the chairman to be theater lead agents for medical material for uh, United States Forces Korea, for USAMC K, and then USAMC E for UCOM and AFRICOM. So what does that mean? That's essentially an extension of the DLA strategic supply chain to bring in class eight medical material into the operational uh, theaters. Our last DRU is the United States Army Medical Material Agency. Uh, they're located in Fort Detrick, Maryland, where my headquarters is. They manage all the Army's pre-positioned material, medical material, so APS programs, and then the, the centralized uh, material programs uh, on behalf of the United States Army. Where they also provide our sustainment level maintenance program at three of our depots across the uh, uh, United States. Our APS program is valued at $1.2 billion, and every year we have an approximately $200 million of annual COSIS requirements. Lastly, our integrated logistics support center and our LAP, they serve as the heart and soul of our LCMC mission. And that's actually a fairly new mission for um, AMLC, uh, really just getting off foot over the last two years. They enable readiness at the tactical edge and serve as fleet managers for the Army's 80,000 medical devices. You can see our operational numbers here on the, uh, the right side of the slide. But the key takeaway on this slide is AMLC truly uh, supports global operations for the joint force. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here. So we envision, um, as General Edmondson talked about, um, integration into AMC. So historically, Army medlock processes have been decentralized and disaggregated from Army sustainment activities, including the life cycle management of medical devices, all the way down to the Class 8 ordering, receipt, storage, and distribution. And in fact, I grew up in this era where we were totally disaggregated and decentralized. So it's actually really nice that I've been along this journey since 2019 when I served at one of those DRUs as a deputy commander. So I've seen that growth. As General Edmondson articulated, this is the first time that in the Army campaign plan we hear the words medlog in there, specifically directing us to integrate in the Army sustainment enterprise. So this will improve efficiencies and readiness across the, the globe, and that was really the driving factor in 2019 to move MedLog over to AMC. So here's a look at kind of the future operating space. Um, what we'll see starting in first quarter of FY25 is Class A integrated into our multi-class SSAs and within our sustainment ERPs. So this will be the first time that Class A is actually ordered in GRME. This integration will also create depth um, of this very life-saving commodity, and it's absolutely essential to ensuring that we can fight and win in an MDO environment. So now we'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna get there. So a lot has improved since this transition, but there's still gaps. So medlocking and campaigning is designed to mitigate these systemic challenges, which include a lack of COP, decentralized material management, deficient demand forecasting, non-standard catalogs, and a reliance on the Defense Health Agency fixed medical treatment facilities where in the past our operational formations received class 8 and medical maintenance and support. So this was codified in the next order and the MIC program will uh, is actually leveraging the whole of Army approach across the Domo PFP and uh, has a two-star GOSS and General Edmondson is one of the co-chairs to accomplish this structure or this mission. The key tasks of MIC include integrating class 8, class eight within the Army Systems of Record, so that's G-Army today and soon EBSC, integrating Class 8 within the Army Operational SSAs through the extension of the AUKOF, integrating MedLog within strategic and theater distribution systems, and then integration into the wider sustainment COG. So we will execute this proof of concept over several phases, and it will be conducted with elements at the 82nd Airborne, USASOC, and in USARAF. So phase one is heavily focused on G-Army system 
uh, changes, training, and outfitting, along with the development of a curated catalog comprised of medical material that, that is aligned with unit sets and author authorized assemblages. The proof of concept will take place with the 189th DSSB in the 51st Medlock Company at Fort Liberty. They will start with a 336 line ASL valued at approximately 300,000. It will be demand supported thereafter. We'll also be doing this at First Special Forces Group at JBLM and they'll have a smaller ASL valued at about 100,000 and then again at 2CR in Germany. The proof of concept will last approximately 180 days and we'll have continuous assessment. We know there's going to be some clanks along the way and we'll just uh, we'll fix those and get those all worked out before we move to IOC. Essential to IOC is making those required system adjustments and training so we can uh, ensure that our force is prepared. It's also extremely important to note that, that we're nested with, uh, uh, like I said, all stakeholders, so specifically institutional training. The Sustainment Center of Excellence has already provided Class 8 familiarization training within their 92 series MOS soldiers and already have trained 700 soldiers. Training will also be uh, integrated in the, the advanced leader course for our NCO SSA leaders uh, starting next month. And G-Army has also been integrated into the Medical Center of Excellence for all the um, uh, AMED specific AOC or MOSs and AOCs that deal with medical logistics. So many of you that are maintainers are probably thinking, what about medical maintenance? Did you know that approximately 35% of the Army's medical devices do not have organic maintainers assigned? And that's probably un not unlike some of our other commodities. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to address that. Um, historically, Army MTFs provided that service at home station, but with the transition to DHA, that no longer exists. So we have to come up with a solution. Another example is uh, combat aviation brigades. They have a high equipment density, but no 68 alphas. So as you can imagine, this impacts readiness and deployability of our forces. So we will execute this medical maintenance proof of concept also at Fort Liberty. This concept will align with AR 750-1, which states LCMCs will provide field level maintenance to units without organic maintainers. The work orders for the first time will be accepted in G-Army, and it will provide commanders asset visibility during the entire maintenance process. We'll also be working with the North Carolina National Guard to exercise uh, supporting Comp 2 units in this proof of concept. Of course, sustainment level maintenance will still be done at our depots, but now work orders will be transitioned from G-Army to the higher level maintenance. So the desire, desired outcomes here are increased readiness and visibility to the command, reduced turnaround time, and reduced transportation costs, and the integration of Class 8 repair parts tied to the medical device. So no longer will we order parts in one system and then manage maintenance in another, so no more swivel time. And this also gives our ILSC access to data analytics so they can better manage the fleet and uh, hit trend analysis uh, using the Army system of record. So in closing, I, I would just like to say from now until FY28, because this will take long to get it throughout the Army, the Army will implement MIC using a banded and phased approach tied to resources, operational right requirements, and rearm. Because the future fight will have much more demand on Medlog, we believe these concepts will posture the supply chain to be more agile with more depth and endurance to meet these demands. Commanders at Echelon will now have an integrated cop to enable operational decision making, and this will increase readiness and improve survivability of our force. Bottom line is we must organize and integrate now we must train as we fight so we can execute at the speed of war in MDO and Lisco. Before questions, I'd like to turn the time back over to General Edmondson for any closing comments. All right, thank you. So, for, for those that are familiar with how CECOM and TACOM and AMCOM all handle sustainment uh, and maintenance, uh, that's exactly where we're taking AMLC. There is no difference. And so to the soldier, whether we're shipping a, an engine forward, a component to a rotary wing aircraft, a circuit board, or an OR, there should be no difference at all. And so again, if you understand how C5 ISR has been uh, operating over the years with regard to how systems are developed, the partnerships with the PM, the LCSPs that are all to be developed along the way, the dot mil PF, and we'll free, feel free to ask questions about that if, you, if you'd like. That's exactly the direction that we're taking Army Medical Logistics Command. 
We look forward to your questions. Thank you. I, th I think they're scared of medical logistics. <laughs> But, but, but that's okay, that's why we're here, right? So we want, we want to actually... So, I'll talk a little bit about money. As we take Army Medical Logistics Command and shape it uh, to fit inside the AMC Enterprise to work with that, within SECOM uh, as well, it's going to be important for us to be able to delineate between SSPEG responsibilities EEPEG, think R&D, or work with the PM responsibilities, uh, and TT, think field level responsibilities. That is an area that we are laser focused on because as the commander had mentioned, and I talked about a little bit earlier, low density. So not only low density, but in some places there might be no density. And so we are acutely aware of that challenge uh, and while we are putting rigor into the process, what we are not going to do is slow down anyone's readiness. But what we have to be able to do is have a full dot mil PF conversation uh, about uh, all components of medical logistics, skill sets at grade, at echelon to perform functions. We do believe that at the end of the day, there are some functions in this highly technical career field that are best suited for Army Medical Logistics Command to continue to perform over time, but we are going to need to establish fiscal financial reimbursement relationships uh, to leverage the EE and the TT uh, along with the SS. See, I, I, I knew if you talk money, that will get people going. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, Mike Hill, McKenzie and Company. You mentioned, sir, the uh, you know making the medical logistics command look a lot like uh, AM, AMCOM, TCOM, AMCOM, et cetera, CCOM. Well, what they primarily deal with, primarily not being operative, but is obsolescence, right? And maintaining warehousing and how you really track that. And I'm just curious about the parallels in the medical community to that uh, major challenge for your your command. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So, uh, probably the most fundamental difference that we are doing now is, now that we're in LCMC, we are managing truly the life cycle of the device. So we're working with the PM right from the beginning to develop those LCSPs, the sustainment support plans, to include divest divestiture. And, um, and that, it, it's a challenge, right? Especially since now, um, none of our items have actually transitioned to sustainment. So now we're playing catch up and getting all those um, systems. So. I'm sorry, before you ask that question, just as a quick follow up, I mentioned, uh, I think I'm gonna stand up and move away from this speaker here. I mentioned a bit earlier three areas where we had a lot in common between C5 and ISR and medical. Uh, divestment is another one, that's the fourth. Uh, when you take a look at the C5 and the ISR portfolio, there is a very close partnership between CECOM and each of the PMs and the PEOs because as that technology changes so rapidly, we've got to be aware of divestment, divestment opportunities. We are the ones that are probably working most closely with the uh, defense industrial base to forecast out potential replacement parts as they're needed. Uh, but what we, we don't want to be able to do, what we don't want to do is forecast for parts knowing that we're going to divest. So there's a delicate balance. This is probably an area where i got to admit I probably learned the most over the last couple of years, is that delicate balance between us wanting to divest and bring on new, uh, divest so that we could free up dollars and space for something that's newer. The reality is, if the newer product is delayed by a day, that's one more day that the older kit's gonna remain in the formation. And so we've gotta be sensitive to that. And so as we stand up the life cycle management command uh, capability, that is one of the responsibilities of the LCMC is to be able to not only look at today, but look at tomorrow, and we've gotta be able to balance the books. Does it work perfectly all the time? No, it doesn't. Are we maintaining C5 and ISR today that we thought would have been divested a few years ago? Yes. Are we responsive 
and uh, do we do a really good job of partnering with a lot of folks that are here right now on continuing to maintain parts flow for something that may have been deemed uh, divestment worthy a year ago? We do that because we know that, the, that there is a possibility that we're going to be asked to maintain a piece of equipment a little bit longer. Uh, good afternoon, Alan Karkadoff from the Armored Sergeant General's Office. A wonderful presentation. Uh, looking for predictive logistics. Are you investing anything in artificial intelligence? Yeah, so we are heavily involved with uh, PL uh, CFT. And in fact, I have our ILSC director that's probably the foremost thinker on medlog and predictive logistics. Van, do you have anything you want to comment specifically? Oh boy. All right, thanks. So we're actually attending the Predictive Logistics Summit this week and have been heavily involved. Uh, a lot of what was talked about in the opening comments about sensors, right? Medical devices are very sophisticated anyway. It's really trying to harness that data from the commercial vendor that's collecting it already. Also, the repair part aspect is also applicable to medical, uh, where we may not have um, the same uh, resources for maintenance, that is really going to be dictated by the FDA. Closer to the center. Okay. So really we're trying to think of the how can we harness what the Army is already doing in other commodities for medical and then thinking through really patient casualty estimates with ICD-9 code to those supplies. And as we get more data in conflict, how do we update those PCOF tables? How do we update MPTK? How do we update that planning tool to develop push packages against what was already pre-configured and be more responsive at the time of need? Thanks. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good afternoon, sir. So on your OB slide, uh, you talked the medical log systems, LMP, GRME. Can you speak to the challenges that you all have been able to rapidly overcome with regard to systems integration, given that MedLog operated in a very different system from a supply, resupply, maintenance, inventory perspective, and transitioning that into the AMC business model? Yes, so fundamentally it's it's the same. Um, JRME is JRME, right? Our, our biggest challenge is having a curated catalog that is tied to medical equipment set authorizations. There's a lot of medical material out there right now, especially with our current ordering system, hundreds of thousands of items that can be ordered. If that goes into JRME, it would be catastrophic for our supply chain, especially in a contested logistic environment. So I think our, our biggest challenge right now is getting a curated catalog tied to authorized unit assemblages. Thanks. And there's a little bit of a follow-up on that. The IT component of, of your question, the IT component of integrating Army Medical Logistics Command into all Army systems, we can't do this alone. Uh, we've got to be in close partnership with DHA. We've got to be in close partnership with DLA along the way because there are systems that are already running in the background. The name escapes me right now. But again, it is not our aim here to break anything. Uh, it is our aim to move us forward. And so this is a journey. I think we've gotten off to a pretty good start, but you're absolutely right uh, that we've got to get the data right. There are separate networks, and we've got to work with the other services. We've got to work with DHA to bring all of that together in a way that will allow the Army to be predictable, pre predictive uh, in, in delivering effects. We, we have heard here in the conference a great deal um, about transitioning, um, transforming in contact, that's exactly what AMLC has been doing for a number of years. And your point that you're making with regard to the network is critical. And any help out there that anyone can give us on how best we can take our Army data and bring it in uh, to a single network would be very, very helpful. And we look forward to partnering with you on that. Thank you for the question. Uh, may, may as well stay up here. All right, well, look, we want to thank everyone for coming out. We're going to train to standard and not to time. Thank you, and we hope to uh, see you around the floor. Take care.
Oh, just, just in case you wanted to ask a very small question. <laughs>
What's it like? Um, there is a food and beverage bucket. Okay. I don't even think, I'm sure they came from China. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next topic will start at 2.45, Transforming and Modernizing Talent Management. Ms. Christina Fries, Deputy Chief of Staff T1, Headquarters AMC, will be presenting. So please gather around, find a seat, and we'll start properly in five minutes.
Okay. 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 I don't want to hit the camera. Please, uh, please uh, find a seat. We'll start in one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, the next panel topic is Transforming and Modernizing Talent Management. Uh, please welcome Ms. Christina Fries, Headquarters AMC, Deputy Chief of Staff, G1. Am I on now? Yeah. Okay. Got me. Just muted her. You play in tricks with me. <laughs> Uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces out there today, though, and it's my pleasure to talk to you about transforming and modernizing talent management. And this is both for our military and civilians. It's a huge undertaking, and it's important to all of us. We're in a race for talent in a competitive and even a contested environment in the people space, and that demands that we rethink our strategies and our methods. So over the years, there has been a significant shift in career mindset. More people are thinking in the here and now, and fewer individuals are staying in one place or with one company for the duration of their career. So how does the Army promote the advantages of career longevity? What are we as the Army going to do differently to not only acquire the military and civilian talent, but develop and employ that talent so that we can retain them for the cycle of their career. People want to stay because they feel valued and they feel like that their contribution to the mission is important. Am I gonna to need to move? I'm sure. Okay. We're really sure? Okay, all right. So, um, we're going to have to do a lot of things differently so that we can keep those people. They want to stay because they feel like they matter. So our Army has to modernize our talent management systems and our strategies to that new career model and even the mindset potentially of shorter term employment. I think we're going to have to do both of those things because we want to ensure that our personnel have thriving, long-term, rewarding careers if that's what they would like but we know that the speed of change is going to be different in the future and that those opportunities have to support assumptions about more frequent changes and turnover in our personnel. And that has to be a significant part of our succession planning. And the Army People Strategy charges us to acquire, develop, employ, and retain the diversity of both our soldiers and our civilian talent to achieve the total Army readiness. So if we'll go to the next slide, please. So transforming and modernizing talent management for our military, I'll start there. The Army has to change its approach to recruiting, training, and preparing our soldiers for the challenges of modern warfare by aligning those individuals with roles based on the unique blends of skills, education, and experience and attributes that they have. It's also important for the Army to align the structure properly to meet those force requirements and ensure that our soldiers have the opportunities, especially when feasible, for that alignment to intersect with their personal needs and wants. IPSA, or the Army's Integrated Personnel and Pay System, is the system of record now that many of you know that we're using. It's both self-service and it has HR, professional level service, and IPSA has subsumed dozens of other systems, legacy systems, to perform a large majority of the HR functions, and it came effectively online in December 23. The Army is continuing to modernize that system, and as we move towards subsuming many of the pay functions over the next few years, we're going to complete that integration 
and allow for the full deployment of the talent management life cycle for the force. Talent acquisition of our military is also important. The Army in 2023 enlisted about 55,000 new recruits, and that is going to allow us to keep our active duty in strength at the goal for 2024. But competition for our America's talent is more intense than it ever was before, and we're going to have to make modifications to our recruiting enterprise. So the high school market has been the backbone of the recruiting efforts for several decades, and we realized that the high school population represents only about 20% of the potential prospects for our pool. So our goal is going to have to shift to include more of the college market, and I would include in that the trade school and the industrial arts market, essentially those that have education beyond the high school level, especially by 2028, that's going to be needed. The Army is developing a more permanent and specialized talent acquisition workforce with the establishment of 42 tangos and 420 tangos, which is talent acquisition specialists and technicians, to make sure that we're recruiting with people that are subject matter experts in, in this area. We have to develop new methods and how we're going to market our technologies and to recruit these efforts. The U.S. Army Recruiting Command is standing up experimentation capability. They're going to test and evaluate the trends in the labor market. And this is going to grant USAREC the authorities and the resources that are going to help us to drive innovation and technology as we evolve those trends in the labor market. And so they're standing up a three-star command with USAREC, acknowledging the importance of this mission. So that is part of the way ahead for the Army. So the fact that the Army is a place where Americans can be all that they want to be, we have to continue to make sure that we convey this to our potential recruits of military service, our civic leaders, and those um, that are, can help us to send the message of what the Army offers far and wide. And all of these initiatives are posturing the Army to continue to be the service of choice. So I'll talk about talent preservation for just a moment. The Integrated Prevention Advisory Group, or the IPAG, represents the Army's ev evolution of prevention workforce. It's designed to employ evidence-based policy, programs, and practices that prevent harmful behaviors across the Army. In 23, the Army hired 80 individuals to focus on prevention, and we plan to hire about 200 more throughout this year. And these individuals are assisting commanders in identifying evidence-based policies, programs, and practices that are going to increase the protective factors, build positive environments, and help us to prevent harmful behaviors across the Army. And the focus is on the activities that bolster the protective factors to help prevent sexual assault, self-harm, domestic violence, and intimate partner violence, as well as child abuse and the work, workplace violence within our formations. The concept is to make sure that those individuals and teams are equipped with the tools to reduce risk factors to prevent events, as opposed to intervening or reacting during an event that is in progress or that has already happened. And so this is also not a decrement to those services or resources in the intervention and response space, it is additive. And the Army is adopting a public health systems approach to prevention that is going to focus on mitigating risk and strengthening the protective measures to decrease the stressors that lead to all of those unhealthy behaviors in the first place. So our soldiers are our most valuable resource and they deserve these continued efforts. So that's a little bit about what we're doing for our military. Um, on the next chart, I will, it's sort of an overview, I'll talk a few moments about talent management for our civilians. So just like transforming and modernizing the military, the civilian workforce has to be transformed and modernized in alignment with the Army People Strategy and the Army Civilian Implementation Plan. The Army's Civilian Implementation Plan has four lines of effort, acquire, develop, employ, and retain. And as you can imagine, there's many initiatives that are cross-cutting across those areas that impact them. And so in my position, I serve as the Army's lead integrator for the RETAIN LOE. 
And Army level initiatives that are ongoing in that space are include uh, promoting holistic health and quality of life programs, continuing to build on the workplace flexibilities, improving the selection of our supervisors based on their demonstrated leadership ability and potential in addition to the technical competence. Also institutionalizing a culture of high performance, which is really about awards and recognition. Utilizing stay and exit surveys, we plan that as part of our way ahead. And overall strengthening the culture of employee engagement. Many people don't realize that Army civilians make up over 21% of the Army's personnel and Army Materiel Command, as the largest ACOM, has a 95% civilian workforce. So in September and January, respectively, AMC published our People Strategy and Civilian Implementation Plan, which is of course nested with the Army's guidelines. AMC has conducted several initiatives this fiscal year that align to the Army People Strategy, and so I want to highlight just a few of those for you this afternoon. First, I'll start with the five-page resume pilot. Beginning in 1 December of 23, we started a pilot that's scheduled for one year. And we implemented this for all incoming job applications through USA Jobs. It's designed to expedite AMC's hiring procedures and make sure that we have efficient candidate evaluation process. And so there's clear verbiage in these job announcements that reads, please limit your resume to five pages. If more than five pages are submitted, only the first five pages will be reviewed to determine your eligibility and qualification. This really aligns with industry best practices and those of you that are here that are from industry would even probably um, arguably say that a five page resume is too long. But if you have been inside the system and had the experience, you know that many times we receive resumes 15, 20, 30 pages long. And so bringing this best practice to bear to shorten the resumes to be concise and well structured is going to make a huge difference in our hiring process. If applicants submit resumes that are longer, only the first five pages of the resume is considered by the HR specialist and the hiring official in the selection process. In a small scale pilot that we did at one of our subordinate commands before we implemented this across the AMC enterprise, in that short experiment alone, we saw hiring times reduced by an average of 51 days. So we're extremely excited about the potential that this has across the enterprise. Another pilot that we were part of is the contact to contract pilot. The Army asked AMC, two of our commands, Joint Munitions Command and Installation Management Command, to conduct a short pilot from 13 November to 31 January of this year. And the goal was to develop and implement an average 30-day timeline from when a candidate is referred, gets a notice of referral, until they receive a final firm job offer. Part of the action of this pilot was to pre-position the hiring panels, the interview questions, the determination to offer incentives, and the interim security clearance process. Now some of those are best practices that have been available to us for some time, but haven't been used across the spectrum by everyone. But in addition to that, it was to bring candidates on, expediting some of the security process before final drug tests are received, because it, it seemed that the risk reward for that was going to make a difference. So the, the pilot has concluded, but uh, DCPAS, the Defense Civilian Advisory Services, is still conducting the analysis on that, so we are anxious to see the results of that and hope that that bears fruit as part of the Army's way ahead. Another initiative is rocket vetting for rapid hiring. Some of you might have heard of that. We are now calling this the rapid hiring initiative. And this proof of concept um, is the fielding the program is really a collaborative effort between headquarters AMC, our subordinate commands, the FBI, the Army staff, Army security officers, and the Civilian Human Resources Agency, CHARA. 
So the proof of concept is being conducted to help the Army not lose the best talent and to keep the best applicants. And so what we've done is we can make job offers at numbers and speed on par with industry employer counterparts, which is a game changer for those of you that have navigated this system. So rapid hiring to strategically adapt the way that we recruit and retain the talent in the Army is absolutely in line with the Secretary of the Army's objectives. And so we first tested this um, this year at the Vega Career Fair on 16 and 17 February in Baltimore, Maryland. We had fingerprinting machines, people were encouraged to complete SF-86s before they arrived. We had specialists there that could help people navigate that process on site if necessary, and security interviews were also being conducted on site. And so it was aimed at vetting our talented applicants in real time to be able to make on the job, on the spot job offers. So the out, some of the outcomes of that event were that AMC collected over 3,200 resumes. In that time period, we conducted about 357 interviews, and we expedited one candidate all the way through that personnel security investigation portal process during the event. The on-site fingerprints that were taken, even if those candidates were not offered jobs during that event, those remain on file for four months, which continues to accelerate the possibility of making job offers to candidates in, in, that, in that time period. Coordination with Chara is, Chara is still continuing and providing qualification reviews of our hiring managers and pre-screening resumes to continue that momentum. We expedited the security screening process for a, a few additional weeks beyond that event and we were able to vet a number of additional resumes, ultimately conducting 95 more interviews and a total of 452 altogether. So what happened as the outcome of that? In 2023, our objective was to be able to offer letters of intent. And so we had great success with that in 2023. Well, in 2024, I have this wonderful statistic we increased our on-the-spot job offers over 8,000% because we made 86 on-the-spot job offers, which we had never done before. And so what AMC accomplished far exceeded what all other Army commands that were not using this process were able to do. We had 28 firm job offers and 24 entrance on duty dates established and six employees onboarded compared to one firm job offer and one OD, EOD for all of the rest of the Army. So the way ahead is to continue to leverage this and refine this rapid hiring initiative. It is quickly becoming a best practice, even though we're still testing and navigating different ways to take different aspects of this to events and scale them according to those events. It's going to be tested next month at the Total Army Recruiting Event in Dallas. And so we're excited about what we can take to that event. It's a much shorter event, so I think we'll have fingerprinting and some of the things that we were able to do at VEA will not fit that event. But the point is the ability to customize and tailor this to help us accelerate our outcomes. And I have one more example to give you this afternoon. And Ms. Wicker spoke, and many of you heard her yesterday, talk about the Organic Industrial Based Modernization Plan. And line of effort three in that is the human capital or the people that are part of that plan. And so we have, along with a, a couple of other pilots that have been conducted in the Army, there's been some work done on the uniform side and in the contracting community. We are now doing an organic industrial base, talent management and career mapping tool pilot. The Army lacks the ability right now to be able to assess our workforce competence, capabilities, and capacity using objective data analytics to support our deliberate talent management and strategic organizational decisions. And so the Army has to be forward-looking and data-driven to be able to make sure that we have the right person in the right place at the right time. And so the 2022 Army Civilian Implementation Plan, those priorities and those lines of effort are directly tied to the outcomes that we're talking about in the talent management and career mapping pilot. 
So in AMC, when we began this in the organic industrial base, we have started with six occupational series at our OIB sites. There are two GS series and four wage grade series. And that's what is really significant about this because often when we think about the civilian workforce, the default is to our GS workforce. And the laws that govern and control the federal wage system for our wage grade personnel are different than the GS personnel. So we are including wage grade in this. And we have started with logistics management specialists on the GS side and welders on the wage grade. That's our starting point. The first two sites for this will be at Corpus Christi and in Anniston at both of those depots. And we will pilot that in the next couple of months. We've already had volunteers, started focus groups, and so we're excited about the way ahead. That tool is going to help modernize and develop how our OIB workforce trains, plans out their careers, and grows as professionals. For individuals to be able to use the tool to set career goals, track their process, and see different pathways for how they can facilitate their way through their career as an employee is, is really what it's all about. Where can they see themselves? What training and skills do they have? What gaps do they need to close? And how do they get that training that they're looking for? And so the Army is really going to have to invest in an enterprise capability, and so that's what these pilots are about, is to inform what the Army's enterprise decision about talent management and career mapping is going to be. The added benefit is having this information not only helps our employees as individuals to be ready, professional, diverse, and integrated, but it helps us to be able to do that ever so important succession planning as we try to see that future that I started this conversation by talking about. What is it going to be about the longevity and the things that are important to our workforce and what keeps them and what gaps we need to fill in the future. So um, I will go to the last slide. Um, in closing, I just want to say that the Army is making great strides in transforming and modernizing our talent management. And success is going to require our collective efforts across the DOD. It's going to be done in concert with our industry partners and academia. We have many partnerships in place. We need more of those. We need to take regional partnerships to the enterprise level. And Army Material Command is all in on transforming both our military and our civilian workforce to acquire, develop, employ, and retain the diversity of our soldiers and civilians that we need to make sure that we have total Army readiness. So thank you for your time this afternoon, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? I appreciate those of you that have spoken to me in the last uh, day and a half about some of the capabilities that you have. I look forward to continuing those conversations. So, yes, ma'am. Testing. Okay. I'm Melissa Hadley. I'm with Ernst and Young in our human capital practice. Um, and I heard you talk about um, uh, modernizing the way you approach recruiting, moving away from focusing on the high school student and considering uh, college students, trade school students. I'm curious about what other demographics you might be looking at. For example, you know, a, a lot of the clients that I work with and colleagues that I work with who did serve, they came into the Army for very specific reasons. Um, and so how do we make uh, Army uh, attractive to folks who may not have those same, that same background or may not, those same reasons don't appeal to them? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. So it is about all of the categories I talked about. It's about our veterans who have served, and it's about our ability to reach out to those communities and those locations where they don't have that background of information. They don't know someone who has served. And the civilian marketing campaign is coming to market in the near future. I don't have the details of information on that, but I'm excited that we are going to add this formal civilian marketing campaign along with the military campaigns that we do. And, and that's also part of what I think is important about what we're testing in the Total Army Recruiting event that's going on in Dallas. That is a regional event in a large market trying to bring all of the Total Army all combos and civilian recruiting together and they have tested some marketing and methods that is intended to reach less traditional 
prospects. And so we still have a lot of work to do, but that, that is the direction that we're moving and that's my initial thoughts. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Tree, go ahead. Is your initiative just to bring on board Army Fellows or is it Army Fellows and those that qualify for higher level positions as well? Thank you for that question. So we are looking for employees from students that are still in high school all the way up to senior level positions. You know, we need to train up and through our ranks and we also need to insert across the ranks so that we get the variety of skills and experience that's going to take us to the next level. Yes, yes ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, you spoke briefly about changing the mindset and the expectation for employee longevity to shorter time frames. Can you speak to how that's going to impact our succession planning for building the bench for our next round of, of leaderships at all echelon? Sure. So we are starting to educate ourselves about this, right? We have our traditional thoughts about people approaching retirement eligibility and when they're going to leave the workforce. And I think if we really examine the facts, we see that the behavior of our people is not what we presumed it to be. And so making sure that we understand the generational differences and those tendencies and the predisposition for what people are looking for to satisfy them, to make them feel like they're contributors. And so it's going to be a mix. We anticipate that the younger workforce coming in is going to be less interested in a long career in one place. But the Army is a million career opportunities in one, in one company, so to speak. And so I think it is about how we explain to those individuals the opportunities that they have. There are opportunities to stay where you are. There are opportunities to serve all around the world. And we just need to have the data and the decision-making tools available to us to understand what behaviors are actually occurring so that we focus our energy on those needs where we really do need to plug people into the process. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much for your time. Thanks.
FRBs? Are you talking about the legged ones? Are you talking about the ACRBs that were a potential option as a new blade? For better blade, I thought it was something we were working with a couple years ago. So the answer is bad, unfortunate news story because I think it was pretty bad.
For discussion today is censor to shooter, all domain decision advantage in Lieutenant General Hale, headquarters Army G2 will introduce the panel and we have a couple minutes before we start. So go ahead and gather around, find a seat, and we'll get started momentarily. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, since this is the, it's the last panel, uh, General Hell, if you are ready, we can start. Okay, can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sensor to Shooter All Domains Decision Advantage Warrior Corner. I'm Tony Hale, the 48th Army G2. But before I get started, I really want to take a moment to extend the personal thanks to the Association of the United States Army for hosting this superb event. Under the leadership of General Retired Brown, the Association continues to flourish as an organization embodying the traditions and pride of an Army that is in a few months going to celebrate 249 years. I only have a couple of minutes to introduce this great panel, so I'll get right to it. Our business is war fighting. You've heard that from General Rainey for two days. But as we heard this morning, the character of warfare is rapidly changing, as evidenced by ongoing conflicts around the globe. Threats are evolving and technology is changing the paradigm of how we man, train, and equip our formations for multi-domain readiness. Today's operating environment is more volatile, more complex, more uncertain, more ambiguous than ever before, and I would submit since the end of World War II. This drives us to continuously assess the future operating environment and adjust our posture and it's how we remain ready to fight in the multi-domain environment, to fight and win our nation's wars. Yesterday you heard General Rainey announce the stand-up of the all-domain sensing cross-functional team. That team reflects our Army's commitment to adapt, to continue to adjust our posture, to continuously transform to evolve our capabilities to maintain advantage over our adversaries. The leaders on this stage to my right represent three different organizations fully committed to supporting Army Futures Command in a combined effort to accelerate all domain sensing capabilities and deliver advantage to our Army. I personally and particularly excited about this cross-functional team because of the potential to achieve synergies 
that is unmatched across our Army. Combining the authorities delegated to the Army G2 as a member of the intel community with the speed and agility of Army Futures Command forges a powerful partnership. Working as one team, we will enable synchronized kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities, support the delivery of sensor data to the tactical edge, and assist in this acceleration of machine-based capabilities for the optimization of intelligence, collection, processing, exploitation, and dissemination. Together, we will work to strengthen our sensing ecosystem, focuses, focusing on indications and warnings to not only shape the deep fight, but to also improve the targeting capabilities through a mix of reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition capabilities aligned to the division as a unit of action and to our corps and army combatant commands. If we want to be successful in war fighting, we must strengthen this partnership. To that end, you will see no daylight between the Army G2, Army's Futures Command, and our material developers who support our requirements. Together we will navigate the challenges of the future to secure our nation's defense. This is continuous transformation in action. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Mike Montelion, the Director of the All Domain Sensing Task Force, Mr. Andrew Evans, the Director of the Army ISR Task Force, and Brigadier General Ed Barker, Program Executive Officer for Intelligence and Electronic Warfare Systems. These gentlemen will provide additional details about how we're going to partner to accelerate All Domain Decision Advantage. So Mike Monteleon, the director of the All Domain Sensing CFT. Sir, thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Come on, it's good. It's a big day. Hey, I, first of all, I also want to uh, thank AUSA. And if, if uh, General Brown's in your shot, this has been a heck of an AUSA for me. I just got introduced by the senior intelligence officer for the United States Army. And yesterday, General Rainey announced a new cross-functional team, and the Army asked me to lead it. So this has been an outstanding, outstanding time. It's so good to see all of you. So good to see you all down here in Huntsville. Um, I want to I want to just quickly walk through a couple key key pieces here. You all heard this big announcement yesterday about the new cross-functional team. Right now, I'm in the process of doing the part of my job that I love the most. It's that T in cross-functional team. That's building the team. And I got two awesome teammates over here that have been my teammates before, before this new announcement, and I know we're gonna to continue to be building upon those great relationships. But let me remind everybody, what is the role of a cross-functional team? What do we do in Army Futures Command? So for this cross-functional team, my, my viewpoint, my time frame that I'm looking for is what General Rainey talked about this morning. It's that period between Army, uh, or between 2030 and 2040. So in the past, in a previous, uh, my previous job at AP&T in space, our path was to lead towards Army 2030 and deliver those capabilities to our soldiers. Now we're going to shift our focus to a whole different time frame. And this is, this is very, very exciting for us. Um, now, uh, what is our role in that time frame? It is not only to just establish the partnerships that we talk about, but it is to take the Army's future operating concept, as well as how we operate in a joint war fighting context, identify the types of capabilities, or as we continue forth with identifying concept required capabilities, figure out what elements, not just technology, which is gonna be very important, but how do we fight that technology within our formations to deliver real operational capability in the future? And what that is is a synchronizing function. So I get to be one of kind of the chief cat herders in the Army to pull all the key members of the Army community together, but also our joint partners, our allies, and others in the intelligence community with our G2 partners to really get after a lot of these, these key activities. So I just wanted to remind everybody that's a key role. And the other piece, too, it's not only about materiel. Dot mil PFP across the board, especially a lot of the policy implications, are going to be huge with this CFT. 
And this is really where we're going to have to drive, drive change as a greater community to get after not just what our soldiers need, but get it at the speed our soldiers need it. Now, let me talk quickly about the all domain sensing focus. You could read all these words uh, in the Army.mil announcement that came out yesterday, but our first focus is multi domain dominance, with sensing dominance. So, this is getting after sensing regardless of where it comes from. It could be our stuff, it could be our partner stuff, it could be commercial. And on the same side, it's also denying the adversary the ability to use sensing against us. So, that's the first piece. The second piece, is getting after the sensor architecture. This is the data architecture component of, of, of everything that has to happen here. This morning, General Rainey talked about um, <clears throat> the next generation command and control, or C2. Think about how we plug the sensing architecture, data architecture of the future into that next generation C2. That's a part of our job. Third part, G2 mentioned up here, he mentioned PED. When we talk about machine speed PED, we talk about automated PED, we talk about accelerating the PED process, now that we have data available to us and get it to the decision makers and then get the results of that also to the C2 system so we can synchronize both kinetic and non-kinetic effects, effects against our adversaries. And, and of course the other piece of that is if we go and we decide to do any type of effect, how do we know that that effect actually had its intended you know, impact? and what, whether or not we have to do something else or something different and how fast we can, we can react to that. So big piece there. Last part is what I call operational enablers, which has uh, what I would call the key things that, that were, we were working in my past, uh, my past role in AP&T and in space, but are gonna be absolutely critical as a part of any war fighting system. AP&T will remain as a part of activities that we are going to be working inside of the CFT until you don't need a CFT anymore to get after a lot of those, those, those key aspects. Also, electronic warfare, we talked about non-kinetic effects. That's also going to be something I'm going to be paying close attention to for multi-domain operations in the future. So that's, that's a big thing. Right now, I'm spending time inside the Army. We, we have a pedigree in this CFT of a sensor-to-shooter uh, activity that we bring the whole Army together, and we call it the Sensor-to-Shooter Summit. In the last iteration of this, we have just converted that to something called the All Domain Convergence Action Group. It's the, not only the same folks that have worked that problem space, but it's expanding out now uh, in all the right places. And the whole reason why I wanted to get after this is because, and I'm, I'm talking mostly to you industry out there right now, and the last thing I want you all to do is have to knock on six doors to get the Army's position or the Army's um, uh, thoughts on something that you're working on or uh, perhaps an idea you may have. This all-domain action convergence group, the whole purpose of it is to identify over the next couple of years what are our learning demands? Where are we going to be spending our time and attention on prototyping, experimentation? What are we trying to learn? And oh, by the way, once we learn something and we decide it's the right thing, how do we action it? How do we actually turn it into action as quickly as possible? So I'm really excited for, for where we're gonna go with all that. And then for industry, I want that to be, the output of that to be something that helps all of you because you're, you're spending a lot of time building some incredible technology that we wanna assess on whether or not it can become future operational capability. And again, my goal is to have the community synchronized to be able to speak in at least one or a very similar voice so you're hearing consistency across the entire army, no matter what war fighting functions or what part of the community that you're engaging. So with that said, I want to turn this over to one of my great teammates, Mr. Andrew Evans, the director of the ISR Task Force. Looking forward to your questions later. Thanks, Mike. There's always one guy on a panel that brings like a lot of notes and it forces you to sit in front of this. So um, that's me today. Over the last uh, number of years, really since the stand-up of Army Futures Command, we've been working really, really hard on material solutions that are innovative. Uh, but I hope what you take away from this panel is that we're working equally hard on designing organizations, including cross-functional teams, that are agile and responsive and flexible to multi-domain operations. So it's not just about the material solution. Uh, in many cases, it's about aligning the right organization against that problem to solve the problem. Uh, I'm very excited about this. What I wrote is that uh, if you're going to tackle a complex problem like this, you do that by building a winning team, right? And I think these two gentlemen up here are, are winners. Uh, I'm excited about what this might look like going forward. 
uh, and, and I think we're going to do some really important things. And it may fundamentally change the way we look at sensing and the way we resource uh, this concept of sensing going forward. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Historically, um, and, a, and a lot of folks in here have been around this community for a long time, so you know uh, what I'm about to say is true. Historically, this concept of sensing was very Intel focused. And we built really exquisite things. We built uh, big sensors. They were expensive. They did really powerful things, uh, largely on behalf of the Intel community. But a lot of that data was uh, compartmented. At levels, it made it very hard to access. If you're a warfighter, you would say, I'm sure we have great things. I just don't get it, right? I don't get it at my level. As we talk about what it means to be ready to fight a war in the next fight, we got to move past that. We got to move past that. So sensing for multi-domain operations, I think is going to look different. Two shifts that I see occurring, and these shifts are going to be something that this cross-functional team will tackle. First, we're seeing user demand to accelerate sensor to shooter activities by tapping into data below the top secret level. Right, tapping into that data below the top secret level, maybe even at the unclass level. Think about that for a second. How do we do that? How do we make that shift to more traditional reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition? This is something we've been doing for the last 250 years, right? That, that concept of RISTA uh, in different ways and times. Um, we will be operating disaggregated and dispersed in the next fight. 100% true. And the speed in that fight will be the difference in whether we win or lose. Whether our nation is going to win or lose the next war will be about how quick we can action targets. We've got to close those kill chains fast. To do that, we have to understand the ecosystem in which we're operating, and we have to find ways to connect distributed sensors quickly and at the classification level that a warfighter needs. Not an intel professional, maybe, but a warfighter. To achieve the speed we require, we have to think about how we leverage non-traditional sensors. And this is going to be a little bit wild, but hang with me. Most of our major combat systems today either are or will be built on digital backbones, which means they are running on thousands of microservices and microsensors. We've got to find a way to connect all that because those are sensors across the battlefield. Those are not your big, exquisite, expensive Intel you know, sensors of old. Uh, these are sensors that help us optimize combat systems. Why can't they help us optimize the way we sense in distributed ways? Think about one, one example that comes to mind is our, our helicopters. T today's helicopters and our future Flora. They will all have radar warning receivers of types, right? That helps the pilots survive. I'm a former Army pilot, so I care about such things. Uh, that, you know what that also is? That's a SIGINT system, if you think about it, right? It's looking for enemy radar. How come we can't connect that? We can. We should, and we will. The second major shift uh, we're observing, and you heard Mike talk about this, is the power of machines in the PED process. We have an exponential proliferation of sensors and the associated data that comes from those sensors, but we're still struggling with ways to make sense of all that. We really are. So how do we change the paradigm? Some people will tell you, let's just hire more people. That's not going to be that. I see some heads shaking like, yeah, some yes, you know. If you're a CETA provider, your head went like this, you know. Um, that's not the answer. The answer is not more humans. The answer is in leveraging the computational power of machines and leaning in on targeted investments in artificial intelligence. This is what will help vector our humans to the right problem set. So this will be a little uh, self, you know, self-deprecating about our Intel Core. We, we've done an awesome job in the last 20 or 30 years, an awesome job in PED. But you know what a lot of our really, really smart analysts would do? They'd spend an entire shift reporting, sir, there was nothing significant to report. An entire shift. We cannot do that in the future. We have to take our humans and we have to apply judgment and discretion to whatever the machine presents to them for evaluation. So a machine should tell you there was nothing important to look at, but these few things you really needed to go take a look at. And then the human should look at those few things. That's how you keep up with data in the next fight. Today we still sometimes ask questions like, hey, we're going to build a combat system called a Hades or a TLIS. How many people do I need to ped that? I think that that's a question that eventually can be asked, but the first question should be, what artificial intelligence and machine learning investments do I need to make to optimize this combat system? And if we start there, then we're really optimizing our human enterprise at that point. When we combine the data literacy training that will be needed for our humans with this, what I'll call an Intel version of human machine integration, we will generate exponential enhancements in the speed of decision making and that will allow us to match the tempo of a data-driven war. 
as we tackle these challenges to optimize sensing with the CFT, the other thing that I, I will just say is that we can't lose sight of what we're doing today. So General Rainey also talked about the next couple of years. In the next couple of years, the Intel community in particular is still working very hard on delivering some key systems, Hades, Titan, T-List, T-SIGs, and the Army's intelligence data platform. We're excited about this. We're so excited that we're experimenting with them at Project Convergence, yes, but also on the GIF map and aligning them against real threats. And we're stress testing them and we're learning a lot. Uh, we're making progress there. We're using the lessons to improve system designs. To us, that is what it means to transform in contact. You put it out there, you remain in contact, you learn, you iterate, and you improve your system designs. Uh, just a lot, two last comments. Industry, probably most of you are industry here. Thank you. Uh, I'll reiterate what the boss said and also what Mike said. This is a team sport. And uh, we might work on strategy in the building, but you guys help deliver against that strategy. And so we've had a ton of industry engagements. Some of the problems that you're working on, we already know about, and we're thankful you're working on them. But what's more compelling is that you're working on things that we may not even know are a problem yet. <laughs> That's where you have to be. And you're putting your IRAD there and keep pushing the envelope. Right, help us understand the problems we may not understand yet. Finally, Mike and I recognize that AFC, the task force, uh, and other partners, we exist in the world of requirements and resources and war fighting strategy, uh, but we don't have to bring a lot of this to life. We just come up with ideas. Some of them are good, some of them are not great, you know, and guys like General Barker have to sort through all of that and they gotta bring it to life. And so this partnership, this three-legged stool, uh, from the requirements and resourcing side is only complete when you add the material developers in there. So what I want to do now, no pressure though, is introduce General Barker, and I think he'll talk to you about how we're going to bring some of this strategy to life and the way we develop our material. Alrighty, sir, thanks for the opportunity to be with these two fine gentlemen today. Uh, being uh, you, the, the guy, the, probably the last guy between you and happy hour, I, I understand my responsibility here, okay, truly. So don't, don't think I don't, I'm, I'm not aware of that. So, um, but when it comes to, and my congratulations, I, and it's a great honor. Um, and, and I will tell you from firsthand experience, um, from being a, a PM that has been involved uh, with uh, CFT since the inception. I mean, I was literally one of the original plank holders with Major General Gallagher. Uh, when he stood up the network CFT, I know the partnership that has to happen. I know what it takes, uh, you know, to uh, to deliver. And uh, you have my assurances from our PEO. We're going to continue that. We're going to be uh, agile. We're going to get after the problems, and uh, we're going to help uh, you know the collective team be successful. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I think it's important from our PEO standpoint because I know that uh, from an intelligence, electronic warfare, and sensors. You know, we align to the priorities when you, when you hear the secretary, when she talks about acquire sensors to see more farther, you know, than the enemy, right? I mean, that is that is really what it's about. It's about obtaining that situational understanding to make sure that uh, not only do we have that situational understanding, to, understanding, but we're doing it in a data-centric manner. Um, that's the way we're just going to have to fight in the future. So, and then, again, from a PEO and CFT standpoint, you know, I, I, we're going to continue to shape the future. We're going to continue to shape all of our modernization efforts uh, as, you know, as it relates to deep sensing, deep sensing across space, high altitude, uh, all the aerial, the terrestrial layers. Um, there's several programs that are already aligned within the PEO when it comes to this. Um, whether it's the, uh, you know, the, from a mission standpoint, you know, Titan, Alt Nav, Navwar, uh, our MDSS, Hades, all of the launched effects activities. Uh, a range of opportunities across the electronic warfare and tactical layer systems. Um, so, you know, we are just going to be joined at the hip, my friend. And so, and we're looking forward to that opportunity. Um, because what we have to do is we got to support, you know, the range of different uh, opportunities that the Army is going to be faced, uh, that's go that they're going to face. So, the transforming in contact, everything that General Rainey talked about today. So, you know, we cannot just be looking at uh, you know, the next you know, 24 to 48 hours, we have to be prepared to look, you know, look you know, further. And as my organization, I need to be prepared. I have to have the organizational agility to handle change. I have to have the organizational agility to handle changes in resources, changes in the requirements, changes in the threats, and the ability to be able to pivot as needed when things do change. Um, and, you know, that's something that we're absolutely focused on, and I, I, I promise you we'll continue to do that. Um, 
it's something that I know that you can't just say you're going to do as well. Um, it is absolutely something that you have to build from the ground up. It's a culture. You just can't say you're going to be agile. Okay, You have to live it. You have to be able to pivot. You have to learn uh, and learn quickly. And that's one of the things we take a lot of pride in is the demonstrations and the relationship we had with the, with the AP, you know, the AP and T, CFT, um, and then all of our other efforts where you know, we're continuing to have multiple soldier touch points. I mean, that's how we really learn. That's how we really inform requirements. You know, it's getting those, uh, you know, I, I know on Titan specifically, we had hundreds and hundreds of hours of soldier touch points. We had decades upon decades of experience informing the material solution as it evolved and then also informing the rest of the dot mil PF as we kind of understand where things need to go at Echelon, you know, how things need to be maintained. Um, so it's that level of partnership that we're going to have to, you know, to continue to hammer home. And there's just so many opportunities, whether it's Titan, um, whether it's uh, AIDP, as Andrew mentioned, you know, there's just a lot of opportunities there, and specifically in the SIGINT and EW and cyberspace, uh, the TLS family of systems, MFU, um, S2S, we talked a lot yesterday about signature management. You know, there's just going to be a lot of opportunity, and, and you know, we're looking forward to, to being your partner um, and being at the forefront of those activities um, and delivering that, you know, those modernized capabilities. Um, you know, the AFC comes up and develops the requirements and visions, and then you know, we're going to be prepared to deliver that on behalf of the Army, and we're going to be proud to do it, and uh, we'll be proud to be a partner in all this. So, uh, pinning in your questions, uh, they all need to go to Andrew, I think, is what we agreed on. So, uh, we'll take your questions now. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, one thing I do want to just say before we actually take the questions, and I'm going to use the term you've been hearing a lot over the last couple of days, that transforming in contact, but I'm going to use it in a different context. Just to be very clear, the ap and space CFT is going to transform in contact to the ADS CFT. So all of you that worked with me and my, and my great team that I have here in Huntsville, they all still exist, that mission still exists, and over time we will be transforming over the next year into ADS. So don't think that we're just cutting and running. If you have existing relationships with us, we have existing work, we're doing things together, we're still the same people, but we are going to shift towards that new mission over time. And you'll be seeing and hearing us more and more uh, over, the next, uh, over the next year. So, all right, thanks everybody. Looking forward to your questions. Um, with my question, I hope I'm not stating the obvious to everybody else, and I'm just the one that doesn't get it, but what you talked about all this uh, distributed collection and, um, and distributed collection of intelligence information, for example, the RWRs and helicopters and so forth, um, to me that seems to entail um, edge computing AI to, to do as much of the analysis as far close to the collection point as possible, otherwise you're going to have massive bandwidth requirements. Um, is that kind of where you're thinking about going with that? And, um, how do you think you approach that? Is this where I say that everyone else gets it and you don't? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, 100%. Yeah. Edge computing has got to be a piece of this. So we think that bandwidth will be limited and contested, certainly. And so we have to we have to figure out how to operate in those environments. And that's going to involve doing as much of your compute forward as you can, as much of your processing at the sensor as you can, and bringing back the relevant data on potentially a restricted or limited bandwidth. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, my question is, we've all seen requirements uh, be uh, altered and changed in ways by the fast-paced war in Ukraine. Are there any uh, threats in your mind that perhaps some of us will, you know, I just don't want those, uh, those fast-paced changes as far as their, um, you know, threatening programs uh, in their advancement, their future advancement, like MDSS and Hades. You know, this war will end at some point programs like Athena and Hades and those. Uh, I just wonder, is there any risk you guys perceive to those programs being threatened by the present state of affairs versus what the future looks like? Uh, 
Okay. Th thanks for that question. I'm going to touch it from a requirements perspective, and I think if you heard General, General Rainey talk and Mr. Bush talk this morning, the Army is using a variety of different mechanisms to either move really, really fast based upon something that we're like, hey, we need that, we need that now, and then also, as, as CFTs use abbreviated CDDs, we have a lot of flexibilities there as well. The good thing is you don't have to give the entire capability to the whole Army, and you can give it to those who need it. And there's so many different from an acquisition flexibilities, I'll let Ed talk about that, but the requirement side, that stuff is malleable. And we're looking at, quite frankly, right now, we're looking at things that we learned in Project Convergence, look at the requirements we have on the books, and making some decisions to say, hey, you know what, in this future operating environment, we may not have been thinking about that last year, but we're seeing that different now, and there's some real world activity that's driving that. Maybe we need to modify that requirement. And then you're seeing those processes um, being looked at from an accelerated manner so we can get there. Now, you asked specific program questions, so I'm going to turn it to the guys who own the, the program to so, yeah, I'll take a little crack at it. Um, I kind of hit on it a little bit when it comes to the organizational agility of things and how you can pivot and how you, you're prepared for changes and what the future holds. Um, so a couple examples of that um, and, and, and how do you do that, right? So one, one way is you lay the foundation from an open, open aspect, right? Um, modular, open systems, uh, common APIs, common um, you know, frameworks. Our, uh, our integrated sensor architecture is a great example of that. You know, that's how we you know, really build the foundation for a modular, modular scalable, scalable approach to be able to take on what's ever coming next when it comes to the best of breed from a capability standpoint, and then also to adapt to the threat. So, and I'll use Titan as a really good example. Okay, Titan is really the first Army program from its inception that was thought to be uh, a dual pathway program. So from a hardware standpoint, and then the software acquisition pathway. And you know, while all those, uh, the hardware associated with Titan, the antennas, the sensors, you know, those are all exquisite, but they're also COTS. And so it really becomes an integration challenge. But the, you know, the home run there and, and, and the gold is the software and how we manage that. And so it's that iterative approach that, we, that we're gonna be taking. Uh, that now that we own the full life cycle from a software standpoint, you know, and it's the ability to be able to adapt. Okay, it's the ability to be able to adapt based on, you know, what you're seeing from a threat standpoint uh, what you're seeing from a technology standpoint to easily integrate new technologies. So you have to build that foundational aspect. And I think that's what allows programs to sustain, sustain themselves. So it's building that openness up front, it's owning our data, and it's making sure that we have the means to adjust to changes in the threat, changes in technology, changes on force structure, you name it. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you asked about, I think, NVSS and Athena, right? Okay, uh, so let me comment on that. Um, no doubt that the department is learning a lot of lessons uh, in Ukraine. And if we weren't a learning organization, we don't deserve to be the most premier land force in the world, right? So we watch what happens and we pivot. Uh, we, we, make, we give the, the agility to our requirements to ensure that we can. Um, it, it would be dangerous to assume that all things happening in Ukraine would be replicated globally, right? And so what the Army had going in and out. What the Army also has to understand, and, and I think we do, our leaders understand, is that we will exist in sort of the campaigning and, and crisis phases for most of, of our lifetimes, and, and hopefully not in a conflict phase for most of our lifetimes. So in that, uh, that campaigning and crisis phase, there's some unique roles that Hades or, or the Athena as a Hades surrogate will play. Um, and so folks who say, well, we're seeing that, that things that fly like that don't survive, that, that would be true if that was where that system was designed to be employed, right? But what it's doing today, and we can't really talk about here, but what, what these systems are performing today are monumentally impactful for the joint force and a, by extension for the Army service component, right? And so if we could talk at some classified level, you'd be pretty wowed by what, what is being produced today. But we see that as a niche role, uh, that something like Hades plays that directly supports the Secretary's vision of seeing further and more persistently. And for the first time in our history as an Army, we have an Army ISR assets flying daily operations in the Pacific at it, it ranges we could never have envisioned before. So we're very excited about where we're going with that, uh, and we will maintain agility and the requirements as we define what that looks like going forward. Yep. Thank you.
we go. Sorry about that. Leave it up to the test guy to kill everybody's buzz. All right, so we, here at AUSA, there's a huge talk of, about experimentation and, and leaning forward and doing things and you know trying to re relook at how we envision the Army of 2030, 2040. Under the ATUC umbrella, there's a lot of modernization efforts that's happening. I know, Mr. Montmel, we've had you in a couple of times. You've seen some of the work that we're doing. The thing that's missing from our view is that the PMs and the PEOs and, and the experimentation CFTs don't have that mandate. And without it, they're just like, hey, I'll get to you when I'm, when I'm ready to throw it over the accreditation fence to the testers. That's, that's when I'll engage. Right? But if we're going to be able to take advantage of all these cutting edge things and, and, and get at the data sooner, faster to make better decisions, we need those touch points earlier. From y'all's standpoint, is there anything coming down from leadership that's saying, hey guys, in addition to doing all this really cool experimentation, we need to start engaging with tests sooner so that we can make those decisions faster? Thank you. No, great, great question, and I'm going to get away from that speaker. So the, the short answer is absolutely, and we have to. Now, I think it's kind of a two-way street, too, because what we need to do is build realistic requirements that can be tested, right, and, and, and also can be tested in the appropriate threat environments, which that means we often have to have the right threat environments replicated in the right places and available to do that. So it's a kind of a two-way street. It helps both of us. Now, the other thing is it does help us build things that are then achievable and hopefully affordable as well and gives us a sense of, of confidence as we move forward through a prototyping activity or maybe even just demonstration before we get to something that's more directed into a prototyping activity, but we need to. And I would argue, I think you guys are making great strides in the fact that not only are, is ATEC, I, I would say General Galvan owes Galvan his people available if we ask. And you come up with federated architectures now that can collect and act and do great things at different classification levels that give us a lot of confidence as we move forward. And I would argue as we start building CDDs and things like that, we're getting a better, more granular requirement. But, but I think you're talking broadly. I'm talking from my experience, and but the short answer is is yes. Did you guys? I would tell you that uh, our relationship with General Gallivan and the ATEC team has never been stronger, and the things that we've been doing on the rapid prototyping side and leading up to operational demos, events where we needed their assistance from an evaluation standpoint, uh, they are becoming equally innovative when it comes to the ability to how they evaluate. So they've taken the, the great mindset of that, that there's no expectation of this massive monolith integrated test event, like the Super Bowl event. It's the realization that you're gonna have to have assessments along the way. And it's the cumulative value of those assessments that lead you to the point where you have enough data to make a decision. Okay, is this thing ready? Does it meet the KPPs? Does it meet the requirements, right? And so I will tell you that, you know, from, from our foxhole, uh, you know their approach and under General Galvan's leadership. I mean, it's it, you know they are really taking a step forward when it comes to innovation and getting after you know the, the problem. And we're even seeing that proliferate up to DOTD. Quite honestly, I mean they're starting to look at things differently. We just had a great example of that with the TLS man pack, um, where literally first shot, first kill, ATEC, DOTD reports agree. I mean it's it's to that level, but it takes an investment, communication getting them to the table on every instance that you can so they understand what you're doing and where you want to go um, and gaining consensus. Okay, I mean, it, it is really, uh, you know, uh, interpersonal relationships, the dynamics of organizations and making sure that you, know, you can work together. And, and I'm very proud of that relationship with them. General, we have time for one more question. Okay, thank you for taking my question. Jeremiah Johnson, please, Alan. Okay. Um, so, congratulations, firstly, on the CFD. Uh, there are other activities currently going on inside of the Army Corps fighter functions, modernization initiatives. Fires being one of them as a, as a major priority. Uh, C2 Next coming out of PDO CFTs, and, and, they're, and they're all sponsored by CFTs as well, and everybody's working together. Great. How do you guys see yourselves integrating into those special requirements and helping modernize those requirements as well to, to adapt to a more modernized skill chain? Right. Or automated. Great question. Thank you for that. So, 
So we all work for the same boss, which is a good thing, and we all meet at least once a week, and we're all going out to dinner tonight, all right? But, but, I'm, but I'm saying that on purpose, in, in what General Barker said about, about relationships, I would argue the CFT directors work incredibly close. And one of the things General Kaufman, our boss, right, is, is always beats into us is to make sure that we're looking across all each other's requirements as we're working them, regardless of what type of requirement it is, and making sure that the Army's interests in those areas where we are experts at or we are driving the community forward of, hey, here's, here's the Army position, is incorporated in that requirement or we're incorporating the other functions into there. Now, uh, Rory Crooks, right, we, LRPF, we work incredibly close together. Um, Bill Parker, who was out here, I passed him over here at AMD, we work incredibly close together, even with a requirement that we just put out recently that was approved back in December. So within the CFTs, that absolutely happens. And then I will say, inside of Army Futures Command, you heard Kim Newton maybe at the, uh, earlier on, uh, and, and Colonel Promotable Troy Denemy, they were, they stood up a, a organization called the Department or the Directorate of Integration at AFC headquarters that looks across all the AFC activities that helps integrate across some of those pieces. So just in case maybe we aren't experts in that particular area, and I'll use my ap and example, and you really need some ap and to be a part of that weapon system, that's where that flag sometimes would get thrown, and it's just a matter of calling your friend up that everybody's wearing the same patch and wearing the same badge. It actually becomes a lot easier from that perspective. And the other good thing is we're sharing more realistic performance information and cost data when it comes time to build those requirements and just say, oh, you know, throw a commercial GPS for nickels on there, and you're like, no, what you need that to do, it's going to be a little bit more money, but you get what you need to do for that. Did we answer your question? Okay. Hey, thank you. It was a great question. Thank you. All right, everybody. Again, I want to I want to thank you all. Uh, it, it's an absolute honor to be asked by the United States Army to not only be here with this great group of folks doing the Warriors Corner, but to be asked to take on this next CFT. I got an incredible, incredibly um, uh, great group of individuals that are going to tackle these hard problems for the Army, and I'm so excited to see uh, how, how that's going to go. I need all of you to be a part of my team. That T in, CF, in CFT is absolutely critical. But again, thank you all for a great AUSA, and look forward to talking to you afterwards. Thanks.